Warheart by Terry Goodkind Read by Andy Pyle Chapter 20 Richard opened his eyes as he gasped in a breath. The world of life seemed to explode into existence. Out of nothingness, bright light, shapes, and colors began to materialize all around him. At first he sensed only gossamer traces of something more. Then tangible matter began to solidify into shape and substance, as if it had always been in the same place at the same time as the void where he seemed to have been for so long. It felt confusing to not have realized what had been there all along. He began to recognize walls, a ceiling, a floor. There were now limits to the space around him where there had been none. He blinked at candlelight that was too bright, the colors too vivid. The air felt heavy and thick, but he breathed it in greedily letting it fill his lungs in a heady rush. With each breath he drew and then let out, he felt himself exhaling an alien void, breaking the connection to that other world. With every breath he let out, that void dissipated, dissolving away as life came back to take its place. This was where he belonged. He could smell the nearly infinite variety of the world of life. He could taste it. Some of the smells were sweet perfume he recognized and he relished while some was a repulsive stench. It all mixed together into the diversity that was the world of life. The air filling his lungs felt luxurious, intoxicating. He couldn't get enough of it. It was wonderful. It felt as if he had needed to get his breath forever. At last it was coming freely. He could feel his pulse moving through him with every deep breath he drew. Even so, to an extent it was still an unfamiliar effort to breathe. Richard... Richard smiled then at the most beautiful thing he had ever seen in his life. Colin was leaning in over him. She was the sweet bouquet he had smelled. Are you all right? she asked, tears running down her cheeks, her voice a mix of panic and expectant joy, as if she was too afraid to believe he was really with her, and afraid he might unexpectedly leave again. I was with the dead. She nodded, half laughing, half crying, as tears continued to overflow from her beautiful green eyes. I know, she grasped his face in her hands a moment, as if unable to believe it was really him. She looked back then and seized Niki's hand. She pulled the sorceress forward. Niki went to the underworld to find a way to bring you back. Richard put a hand to his forehead as he saw it all again, but this time in his mind's eye. The dark ones. I remember them. Goose flesh tingled down his arms. They were all around me. Niki nodded. I know. I saw them. Richard looked up into Colin's beautiful eyes, eyes that also revealed the inner beauty of her soul. Zed was there, Colin. He was somehow meant to be there to help me, to help free me from the grasp of Sulachan's dark ones. He let me know that it was all to a purpose, that his time in this world had come to its end, and he had needed to move on to be where he could help me. A woman with strange red hair standing behind Niki was nodding. It was all part of the flow of time. It was all meant to be. Her gray dress seemed to be moving as if in a light breeze, even though the air in the room was still. Events happened as they must in order for you to return. You were not yet meant to be finished with this world. Prophecy yet lives. Though no one said it, he knew that this was a witch woman. I must end prophecy if we all are to live. She smiled in a most peculiar manner. Prophecy helped place events in order so that you might be returned to us. The flow of time revealed that the one closest to you by blood was the one who had to be there to help you, or you would have been lost forever. He was meant to be there first, waiting for you. Richard didn't know if that was true or not. As far as he was concerned, prophecy had always been a source of trouble. Colin began gently turning to someone between them, someone else close to him. Still trying to put all the sights around him into order, Richard realized then that the reason he was having some difficulty breathing was because there was something heavy lying over his chest and left arm. He saw blonde hair and red leather. Icy realization flashed through him. Even without seeing her, he knew who it was. Colin gently rolled Kara off to his side, laying her back as if she were a sleeping child. He knew the instant he saw her, though, that she was not asleep. In horrified dread, he realized what had just happened. He remembered the warnings that one must die for him to return. He reached up and felt the Ajil now hanging around his neck. Kara, no, he said under his breath, as panicked fear welled up through him. 
Don't do this for me. Please don't do this. Even as he said it, he knew that it was too late. She had already done it. It was already finished and beyond redemption. She had made the sacrifice she had always sworn she would make for him. She had always said it would be her life before his. Colin swallowed as she cupped a tender hand to his face, wiping away a tear with her thumb. She's with Ben now, Richard. Richard put his arms around Kara, pulling her cold, limp, and lifeless form up to hold her head to his shoulder as he tipped his head against hers and wept with agony for the woman. I didn't want this. Dear spirits, I didn't want this. I didn't want anyone to do this for me. Nikki laid a hand on his arm. But she did, Richard. She wanted to be the one to be the bridge back, and she wanted to cross over that bridge to be with Ben. Richard stared up at the sorceress and finally nodded, too choked up to speak. He knew how much she missed Ben. He understood that kind of pain of being left behind. Richard had given up his own life, after all, to go to the underworld to be with Colin. Even so, and even though he knew how much she wanted to be the one, Richard didn't want someone else, didn't want Kara to die so that he could come back. But he understood it. He couldn't stand the thought of life without Colin, of living in a world empty of her soul. Kara had waited her whole life for love like that, and then she had lost it. Now she was with him and the other good spirits. Richard couldn't stand losing her, and yet he understood why she had done it. Make her sacrifice worth it, Richard, Colin whispered to him. Make it mean something. He nodded as he rolled her to the side and carefully laid her back. He could see the soft glow of the spirit that was still within her, a spirit, a sister of the Ajil, who had come to be with her to help her do what had to be done, and then to help guide her to that other world and Ben's waiting spirit. Richard closed her blue eyes and then kissed her cheek. Thank you, Kara. Please take care of her, Denna. As if in answer, the glow of the spirit vanished then back to the world where she belonged, where she too was at peace. So many good spirits had helped him. He knew that they rarely did so, but this time it was a spirit from their world, Sulachan, who was the cause of the trouble. If the spirit king had his way, he would not only destroy the world of life, he would destroy the peace of that world as well. This was a struggle for the fate of both worlds. When Richard sat up and put his hand around the hilt of the sword, the rage responded instantly with eager intensity. A storm of fury sprang to life, joining with his own anger at the thought of all that was at risk because of Sulachan and the man who had helped bring him back into the world of life, Hannes Ark. Richard could hear shouts outside in the hall, as well as the unmistakable sounds of weapons being used in anger. Men yelled orders, others cried out with the fury of their effort, yet others screamed in pain. It was a call Richard knew all too well. Others had given their lives that he might live, that he might fight for life, they knew that he was the one born to stop what was happening. They knew that by helping him, they were helping in that fight. His purpose had never felt so clear to him before. Prophecy or not, this was the battle he was born to fight. Emperor Sulachan had started this war 3,000 years before and had come back to the world of life to finish it. Richard had been born to be the one to oppose him. It no longer mattered that prophecy had seemed to meddle with his life or had tried to preordain what he would do. All that mattered now was that he was the one to see this struggle to the end. All things had to be in balance. In this conflict, Richard was the balance to Sulichan and his accomplice, Hannes Ark. That inexorable pull toward balance in the battle for life didn't say which side would win, only that in the grand struggle they both were drawn in as balance to each other. Though he was only just back from the world of the dead, and he knew that he had been gone for quite a while, it was beginning to feel like he had been gone for only an instant. It was the timeless element of the underworld, he knew, that made him feel that way. He had been to the underworld several times before, and he recognized that sensation of life interrupted. But now he was back. The battle cries and screams of the injured and dying were a call to the anger within him. These were savages that Emperor Sulichan and Hannes Ark had loosed on the world. So many people Richard knew and cared about had died already. Kara was only the latest warrior to fall. It had to be stopped, and only he had a chance to put an end to it. He slid off the edge of the bed and stood, feeling the weight of life, feeling the weight of responsibility, 
feeling life coursing through his veins, feeling the joy and the sorrow and the duty of being alive again. Life was a gift. He was not going to waste that gift. Richard lifted the sword, touching it to his forehead as he closed his eyes. In the background, he could hear the eager cries of the attacking enemy. They were battle cries his sword was created to meet, cries he was born to counter. Blade, he whispered, be true this day. Chapter 21 The drizzle had started again, making the cool, damp air feel miserable. Tattered-looking leaden clouds drifted silently by low overhead. None of the gathered soldiers spoke. Most stood with their heads bowed. These men, like all of the first file, had known Kara. She had been Richard and Colin's closest protector. Her husband, Ben, had been their general and had been the one who had led these soldiers into the Darklands to find Richard and Colin and bring them back to the People's Palace. Ben had died while helping them all escape from Hannes Ark's trap in the Third Kingdom. The People's Palace was still far off, their mission still unrealized. Now, Kara's funeral pyre was but a smoldering heap, sending waves of heat and wisps of smoke curling gently up into the dead still air. The terrible job completed. There was nothing left but ashes and memories. While Kara was hardly the only one who had died in the struggle against the Spirit King and Hannes Ark, or against Emperor Jagang and the Imperial Order before them, she symbolized for those gathered all the kindred spirits they had lost along the way, all those who had paid the ultimate price for what they all believed in. She had been an inspiration as well as a fierce defender. Richard could never be grateful enough to Kara for all the time she had protected Colin when he couldn't be there. Kara, perhaps better than anyone, recognized the importance of a Lord Rawl who not only loved a woman, but loved life. It had been a very long time since that had been true. That was one reason why Kara had fought so fiercely to protect him. She instinctively knew that he, like Colin, had come into the world for a purpose. Kara's purpose, taken up of her free will, had been to be part of that cause by protecting him. Now, Richard felt numb. He could hardly believe that she was gone. Kara had been at his side for so long, fighting for him and with him, that she had come to be a sister to him, an ever-present protector and companion. It hurt all the more knowing that she had given up her life so that he might live. He felt guilty, felt responsible for her death. Richard knew that most of the soldiers were more than a little astonished that he was actually back from the dead, that he was really alive and among them again. But for these men of the first file, it was also expected that the Lord Rawl could do the kind of remarkable things that they could not imagine. After all, while they were the steel against steel, he was the magic against magic. That magic was a largely alien mystery to them, but they had many times seen its power. The soldiers had been stunned when Richard had charged out the broken doorway, once again alive and once again coming to help them fight off the half-people that had flooded into the citadel. Though there had been a large horde of the half-people invading the place, they hadn't been what Richard had at first expected. They were not Shuntuk sent by the Spirit King and Hannes Ark. These had been a tribe of half-people who had come out to hunt for souls now that the walls closing off the Third Kingdom had been breached. They were just as intent on devouring the living in the hope of stealing a soul for themselves, but they were not as good at fighting as the Emperor's legions of Shuntuk. Even so, besides invading the citadel, they had also killed a number of people down in the city of Saavedra. Richard had led the soldiers down into the city to root out the last of them. They weren't hard to find. They didn't run from soldiers. They came out of buildings and alleyways, seeing Richard and the men of the first file as more opportunities to gain a soul for themselves. Instead of getting a soul, they had been cut down with the ruthless efficiency that only the men of the first file and Richard's blade could deliver. Unlike Kara's farewell, a pit had been dug for the hundreds of dead half-people. No one said words over them. No one would miss them. No one would remember them. As Richard turned to the three moored Sith behind him, he reached up and lifted Kara's Ajil off from around his neck. I have won the Ajil of a number of women who have died for me, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. I can't bear to wear this one. It will only remind me of all the ways in which I failed her. I would like to pass it on to you, Cassia, in the hope that, instead of pain, some of her strength will pass on to you. Cassia nodded, fearing to test her voice. Like most Mord Sith, she didn't know quite how to react to being treated with respect. Once captured as young women and trained as Mord Sith, 
They were treated as little more than savage hounds on a chain, beaten to keep them vicious and make sure they followed orders. Richard placed the chain over Cassia's bowed head, and then, after rolling the red agile in his fingers for a moment, he carefully let it lie against her chest. He reached back and pulled her blonde braid out from under the chain so it could rest around her neck, then arranged her braid over the front of her shoulder, admiring Kara's agile at the end of the chain. Lord Rawl, she finally said when she found her voice and looked up. I am not the equal of Kara. I am not... He put his fingers to her lips, silencing her. Yes, you are, Cassia. You and Lauren and Vale made the same choice as she did to be free. That shows your strength. You are an individual, strong in your own way, with unique talents and abilities. We will be well served if you are simply yourself and don't try to be like someone else. Cassia nodded, looking a little relieved. I will carry it with honor. It will give me strength as I remember her strength. She gestured to Lauren and Vale. The three of us together will be as strong as Kara was. Richard smiled. Let's hope you are not three times the trouble. Her brow twitched with a little frown. As long as you allow us to protect you as only we can, then we will not be any troubled at all. Mord Sith always thought they knew best how to protect the Lord Rawl. Richard shared a knowing glance with Colin. She returned a small smile. He was heartened to see her smile. Cassia flicked her own agile, hanging on a fine gold chain from her right wrist, up into her hand. She hesitated for a moment. But, Lord Rawl, I don't understand. You are back and seem well again, yet our agile still do not work. The bond is not there to make them function. We still feel nothing. At hearing this, Niki abruptly stepped forward. What do you mean they don't work? Cassia shrugged. They don't work. We can't feel the bond to the Lord Rawl so we can't feel any power from our Ajil. It is the same as it was before Lord Rawl died. Niki glanced at the other two Mord Sith. They shook their heads, confirming that they didn't feel the bond either. The sorceress turned a suspicious scowl on Richard, and without asking, placed a hand against his forehead. She jerked her hand back almost as soon as she had touched him. Looking shaken, Niki pushed her long blonde hair back over her shoulder. You still have the poison in you from the hedgemaid's touch. She gestured to Carlin. When she came back, it was gone, left in the underworld. You still have it. It sounded like an accusation. Although he was doing his best to ignore it, Richard could feel the pain of that deadly sickness deep inside. When he had come out of the bedroom to fight the invaders, the rage of the sword had blocked the ache of the poisonous infection. But now that the sword was back in its sheath, he again felt the full weight of the sickness. I took that touch of death out of Colin when I was there with her in the underworld. I can't explain how I did it. I just did. But I couldn't take it out of myself. I still carry it. In alarm, Colin seized his arm. You still have that infection in you? You came back to the world of life only to die? Richard, you can't... I came back, Richard said, cutting her off. He had more important things on his mind and didn't want to get into it right then and there. That's what matters. Even though I carry that same taint of death, I came back so that I can stop Emperor Sulichon and Hannes Ark. If you live that long, Nikki said under her breath. Richard, you know better than me that if it's not removed, that poison is fatal. I do. But I don't understand why you couldn't leave it in the world of the dead, Colin said, her exasperated expression darkened by fear and dread. That is the perfect place to leave that vile poison. The world of the dead is the perfect containment field for the touch of death. I couldn't do that. He waved away further discussion of the topic. He was already in a bad enough mood over Kara. Look, I'm back. That's what matters for now. Sulachan is like that poisonous touch of death loose in the world of life. We have to stop everyone from dying, not just me. I came back to do that. That is the priority. At least being in the world of the dead for a time caused the sickness to dissipate somewhat. It bought me at least a few more days. Niki was beside herself with bottled fury. A few more days. Are you really sure, or are you just saying that? You felt it. For now, it isn't as strong as it was before. It's still there, and it will once again advance the same way it did before. But for the moment, it's a little better. It will take some time for it to catch back up. That buys me some time. Not willing to take his word for it, Niki put her fingers to his temples on either side of his head. He could feel the tingle of her magic probing deep within his skull. 
Then it felt like tiny flickers of lightning dancing down his spine and his arms to his fingertips, stinging as it went down his legs. She finally pulled her hands away, looking a bit more composed. He's right. It's not as strong, but it will be within days. Colin glanced impatiently toward the southwest. We have to get him to the containment field at the People's Palace so you can pull the poison out of him. Nikki hesitated. I think the palace may be too far away. By her answer, and by the way the sickness felt, Richard knew that it was too far to make it there in time. There are horses here, Colin said, not ready to give up so easily. Richard nodded, yes, but Sulachan and Hannes Ark are heading there, and they already have a big head start. Even if we race for the palace, getting past those forces won't be easy. Worse, and more likely, if they beat us there, then getting through the horde of them surrounding the plateau in order to get into the palace will not be at all easy. Colin folded her arms in frustration as she shook her head. I don't understand why you couldn't have left the poison there in the underworld like you did with me. Why wouldn't it work for you to leave it there? Balance, Red said into the drizzle. What? Colin asked, turning to the witch woman. Many things had to be in balance for him to return to the world of life. This must have been one of the things that had to be. Colin was clearly not ready to concede this point either. Well, I don't see... The witch woman suddenly grabbed Richard's arm and pulled urgently. You need to move. Richard frowned as she began dragging him away. Why? That guard tower is going to fall where you are standing. Chapter 22 Richard was at a loss as to why the witch woman so suddenly believed the tower was about to fall, but it was clear that she did. As he allowed her to lead him away, he glanced back at the unassuming tower constructed of heavy stone blocks. Constructed back at the same time as the citadel during the Great War, it was as solid as the rock it was made from. It had stood on that spot for thousands of years, watching over the road up from Savedra below. A couple of other towers on the other side of the citadel watched over the trackless dark forest beyond. Like so many things in this part of the Darklands, it was part of the precautions having to do with the barrier to the Third Kingdom. This particular guard tower had been invaluable in alerting the men of the first file of the attack by the half-people. No doubt that had been a part of its ancient intent. He had trouble imagining why the solidly built tower that had stood for so long would abruptly fall over. But he knew enough about witch women in general to take her seriously. Richard didn't really know much about this particular witch woman. Colin had gone without him to see Red before, so he had met her only after returning from the underworld. She had helped Nikki in that journey into darkness to come and help find a way for him to return. Hurry, Red growled at them, not satisfied at how fast he was moving as she dragged him away. Move back! When he saw that the soldiers were not moving and looked confused, Richard signaled with his free arm, Back! Everyone, move back! Confused men finally scattered at his command. What is it? Colin asked as she followed Richard and Red, hurrying away from where they had been standing beside the funeral pyre. Before Red could answer, Richard felt the ground beneath the cobblestones beginning to tremble. The delicate lacework of ash from the funeral pyre collapsed inward, sending sparks and smoke spiraling up into the damp air. One of the stone blocks at the base of the guard tower suddenly exploded, sending shards of rock and debris out across the square. Pieces of rock tumbled and bounced across the cobblestones, narrowly missing Richard's group as dust boiled up. Richard heard the distinctive sound of granite cracking and another block at the base of the tower exploded. Fragments of rock whistled past them. A cloud of granite flakes and chunks filled the air, pelting them with small pieces. Get out, Commander Fister yelled up at the two men in the tower. Hurry, get out now! Richard looked up just in time to see the tower begin to sway as the two men disappeared to race down the interior spiral stairs. With two of the blocks at the base shattered, the tower groaned as its great weight slowly began to keel over. The two men dashed out of the narrow doorway as fractures crackled up from the corners of the opening. The men raced for their lives across the square. Another explosion blew apart a third foundation block beside the first two, and with a loud grating of rupturing stone, the falling tower suddenly gathered speed and came crashing down. With a thunderous roar, it toppled across the square right over the top of Kara's funeral pyre. Many of the stone blocks the tower had been constructed from broke apart on impact. Pieces large and small tumbled and rolled away, but most of it disintegrated into a heap of rubble. It had happened so quickly. 
One moment it was standing, the next the blocks exploded and the tower lay scattered across the square. Clouds of dust rolled across the ground and up through the damp late-day air. Had they not moved in time, they would all have been killed. As it was, some of the soldiers had been cut by sharp fragments of flying rock. One man was on his knees holding his hands over a bloody wound on his head. Had Richard not moved, he would have been directly under the falling tower and now buried under the debris. When he turned to her, the witch woman was looking into his eyes. The flow of time. He knew enough about witch women and the flow of time they dealt in to understand what she meant. It had been a form of prophecy. It would be helpful, he said, if the next time you could look a little farther ahead in that flow. It was an eddy that had only just swirled into existence. Events around you tend to be unpredictable and chaotic in that way. Commander Fister planted his fists on his hips. He looked perplexed as he peered at the rubble. Lord Rawl, how did you know the tower was going to fall? Richard frowned at the question. Red told me. The commander cocked his head. Red? The witch woman, Richard said. The commander glanced around. Witch woman, what are you talking about? The woman with the red hair. The commander's frown drew tighter as he took another look around. There was a witch woman here yesterday, but I've seen no woman with red hair. Richard looked for himself. The witch woman was gone. She had been quiet during the ceremony and as they watched the pyre burn. In fact, she hadn't spoken all afternoon until she had told Richard to move because the tower was going to fall on him. Richard frowned over at Colin. She's gone. She gave him a look as if to say that she had expected as much. She told me that witch women have to stay out of events, lest they create havoc in those events. She's leaving what must be done now to us. What I want to know is who created that eddy, Nikki said in a way that betrayed her sense of urgency and ignoring the commander's confusion over the unseen witch woman. Richard was already moving. He knew who had interrupted to create that disturbance in the flow at the last instant. He looked back over his shoulder when he heard boot strikes and saw the whole force of men following. Wait here. All of you wait here. The soldiers reluctantly slowed to a halt, remaining near the cobblestone square piled with the rubble of the tower. Niki, Colin, and the three moored Sith ignored his instructions and followed him without pause. At the moment he needed to catch the person responsible and didn't want to stop to argue with them, but he knew he couldn't let them go all the way. Rather than go down the road, he instead headed in the other direction, around the citadel. She wouldn't likely be down in the city. She would have come out of the cover of the uninhabited woods. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Colin asked as she walked faster to catch up with his big strides. Richard nodded. It has to be her. Who? Cassia asked from behind. What are you talking about? Samantha, Nikki said. The Mord Sith frowned suspiciously. Samantha? You mean the young sorceress who stabbed the Mother Confessor? That would be the one, Richard said without looking back. How could she do such a thing? Cassia asked. It's drizzling and wet, Nikki said to keep the Mord Sith from distracting Richard as he scanned all the places she could be hiding. Samantha can use her ability to heat the moisture in solid objects to make it expand and blow them apart. Objects like trees and even rock. I've never heard of such a thing, Cassia said. Your Lord Rawl generously taught her how to do it, Nikki said with obvious displeasure. I learned it from you, Richard reminded her. Nikki's mouth twisted with displeasure, but she didn't answer. Richard slowed as he approached the opening in the wall at the edge of the more formal citadel grounds. The gardens were nowhere near as ornate as some of the places Richard had seen, but the maze of hedges, stone walks, and orderly patches of wild flowers were lavish for the small city of Savedra. Hannes Ark would have had the grounds kept up as a demonstration of his importance, not because he cared about going for a stroll to gaze at wild flowers. Richard held his arm out as he slowed, stopping all the women. I want you all to wait here. I mean it. She's dangerous. Yes, she is, Nikki said. And she wants revenge against you. And to get that revenge, she would love to kill all of you to get back at me. The same way she stabbed Colin to hurt me. Colin put an imploring hand on his shoulder. Richard, she has already done that. She stabbed me. Now she will want to kill you. Colin is right, Nikki said. You shouldn't be going out there to face her at all, much less alone. That's what she wants. We can distract her and keep her from... I said stay here. His harsh tone caused them to fall silent. They knew he was in no mood to argue with them. 
and they knew too that they couldn't afford to waste time and let her get away. Once he was sure they weren't going to argue, he started for the opening in the wall that led to the marshy fields around the citadel grounds that kept the forest back and ensured that it would be harder for anyone to sneak up unseen. There was no gate. Hannah Sark was more feared than what was out beyond. Richard lifted his sword a few inches, checking that it was clear in the scabbard. He let it drop back in place before he moved into the opening, leaning out to check both ways on the far side. Standing under the arch, he gazed out across the field of soggy grasses, looking for anything that didn't belong. Richard spotted her in the distance among the rushes. Samantha stood like a statue among grasses taller than her. She was about halfway across the marshland to the dark forest behind her. Richard turned back and held up a hand to Colin, Niki, and the three moored Sith, letting them know that he meant for them to stay put, and he would brook no argument. If she makes it past me, he told Niki, you make sure you stop her before she can get to Colin again. Understand? Niki stared into his eyes a moment before answering. I didn't go to the underworld to get you back, only to have a girl with a bad temper kill you. I asked if you understood. Niki pressed her lips tight for a moment. Finally, she folded her arms. I understand. Good, thank you. You came back to the world of life to take care of important matters, Colin warned him. Samantha isn't one of them. I can't do anything about Sulichan if Samantha kills us all first, now can I? Colin didn't look at all happy, but she didn't say anything. She knew he was right. The young woman was the one forcing the issue. It wasn't like they had a choice. When he was confident that they would wait where they were, he started out the opening. Chapter 23 As he made his way among the thick clumps of grasses and reeds, out across the sodden field toward the young sorceress, Richard reminded himself to keep control of his anger. Samantha had stabbed Colin through the heart, and there was nothing else that would ignite his anger the way harming Colin would. But he knew that he couldn't focus on that to the exclusion of everything else. Righteous anger could be a valuable tool, but it needed to be rational anger. Anger against evil. Anger against wrongs. It had to be wielded the same way any weapon was wielded. It needed to be wielded with reasoned wisdom tempered with maturity. It had to be respected for the damage it could do, not only to evil, but also to the innocent. He knew that sometimes ability grew faster than the sense to know when not to use it, like a young man who grew muscles before growing wise enough not to be easily provoked into using them. Although Samantha had been his friend and had helped him a number of times and had even used her anger to save his life and the lives of a lot of good people, her temper wasn't always governed by reason. It obviously sometimes got the best of her. When it got out of control in that way, she was capable of anything capable of hurting anyone, even someone as innocent as Colin. It was certainly understandable that she would be enraged by the sight of Richard killing her mother, but she didn't know all the facts. She knew him, and she should know that he wouldn't harm someone, especially not her mother, without a very good reason. He hoped that by coming out and talking to her, he could convince her to let her better judgment take over. As he made his way through the tall rushes and among patches of blue vervain and swamp milkweed, he could see Samantha up ahead waiting for him. Her frizzy mass of black hair was stuffed into the hood of her cloak to protect it from the steady drizzle. Under the cloak, her skinny arms were bare. He thought she had to be cold standing out in the wet weather. But he knew, too, that anger could heat a person and make them forget the cold. She stood stone still, waiting for him, her dark-eyed glare locked on him as he made his way among the clumps of the grasses bowed over under the wet weight of accumulated mist. The spongy ground was covered with a tangled web of matted dead grass. In places it sank down when he put weight on it, so that clear water rose up over the toes of his boots. He reminded himself to be careful and not lose his footing. He wouldn't want to fall and find himself down on the ground with Samantha standing over him. She had already proven that there were no bounds on what she could or would do. Samantha, he called through the veil of rushes when he was still a good distance away from her. He tried to keep a familiar tone she would remember. I need to talk to you. When he stepped out from a screen of grasses, she spoke in a low voice that was little more than a growl. My name is Sammy. You gave me the name Samantha. My mother called me Sammy. The people of Stroiza all called me Sammy. That is my name, Sammy. I don't want a name from you. Fine, Sammy, then, he said, as he kept weaving his way among the tall thickets of rushes and shorter knots of grasses, steadily making his way closer to her. 
We still need to talk. There is nothing to talk about. You killed my mother. It's not that simple. It is that simple. She's dead. You were the one who killed her. I saw you do it. He thought that there was something odd looking about the young woman, some kind of shimmering aspect to her, something in her big, dark eyes, but in the dreary light he couldn't tell for sure what it was, or if it was his imagination. He had often seen the aura of power around sorceresses, seen it crackling with menace. He could do that, though, only when his own gift worked. Because he still had the poisonous touch of death in him, his gift didn't work. Still, he was sure that he saw something, even though he couldn't tell what. He came to a halt when he was close enough to talk to her without having to yell. He didn't want to get any closer if he didn't have to. He knew what a temper she had, and it was true, after all, that he had killed her mother. Samantha, you don't understand. You have to listen to me. Sammy. You drove a knife through Colin's heart. Because you killed my mother. It was what you deserve. I want you to suffer the same kind of pain I suffer. I want to make you lose everything that matters to you. The same as you did to me. Richard reminded himself to keep his voice calm, the same as when he had talked to her so often before. He plucked a few yellow buds from a blooming ox eye and rolled them between his finger and thumb as he considered his words. Your mother wasn't who you thought she was, Sammy. She wasn't on our side, on the side of the good people of your village of Stroisa, the way we thought she was. She was a protector to our people. She killed your aunts. She killed Zed. Samantha's brow twitched for just a moment before her glare darkened. You're lying. It's the truth. Richard tossed away the ox eye buds and pulled a small black book from his pants pocket. He held it up for her to see. This was your mother's journey book. Journey books possess ancient magic that allows them to send messages back and forth to each other. So? Ludwig Dreyer had the twin to your mother's. He probably gave her the one she had on her. She used it to plot with him. She had been working with him for years. She knew all about the barrier failing long before she let on. She wasn't really going to warn anyone. She and Dreyer were keeping it a secret because they wanted that evil to escape. They wanted to rule over everyone. They wanted power for themselves. They were using the barrier failing as a way to accomplish their ends. Samantha was shaking her head objecting to what he was telling her even as he was saying it. My mother was the sorceress in charge of Stroisa. She didn't even like that much power. She did not want to rule anyone. It was an act she put on, the same as Ludwig Dreyer hid his own abilities until it was time for him to make his move. It was all part of their plan. No one knew their secret. You're making it all up. I know my mother better than you ever could. Richard held up the journey book again so she could see it. It's all in here. All of her conversations with Dreyer are still in here. These books are twinned. What is written in one shows up in the other. Your mother had this one and Dreyer had the other. Her journey book has all of their conversations and scheming going back for several years. There were messages from Ludwig Dreyer telling Irena the specifics of what he wanted her to do for him, along with promises of rewards for her loyalty and service to him. He was using her? Richard shook his head. I'm not going to lie to you, Samantha. She understood exactly what she was doing, and she was doing it willingly. He wasn't fooling her into anything. She was a partner in his plot to gain power. Samantha used a thumb to hook a curly lock of her black hair back off her face. So you say? She says it, in her own words. When Samantha only glanced at the book he was holding up without saying anything, he went on. Ludwig Dreyer advised her on how she should react to people, what to say, and how to behave. He told her the things he wanted her to find out for him. She reported those things back to him. She was eager to help him and for their plan to succeed. She let herself be captured by Hannes Ark so that she would be closer to him in order to report on what he was doing to raise the spirit king from the dead. She was keeping him apprised of his progress and what was happening within the Third Kingdom. He told her to be especially careful not to let anyone know of her occult abilities. You didn't even know of the dark talents she possessed, did you? That's because she didn't want you to know. She was writing to him the whole time we were traveling here, letting him know our progress. 
She told Dreyer of how she was keeping the act up for our benefit, playing along so that we would think she was one of us. Your mother betrayed us, Samantha. She told Dreyer that Carlin and I needed a containment field in order to be healed. She lied to us, Samantha, telling us that there was one here and that she had seen it. You heard her say that. There was no containment field here, so how could she have seen it? She used that lie as a way to get us to come here, to the Citadel, where Dreyer laid a trap to capture us. He told her where he wanted her to say the containment field was located within the Citadel, and how to get down there as a way to get us to the dungeons, where he could take us by surprise. He laid the trap, and she walked us right into it. Lies. My mother wouldn't do such a thing. Richard held up the book again. It's all in here, Samantha. In her own words. In her own hand. Your mother and Dreyer discussed how they couldn't risk any of the gifted in Stroiza, learning that the barrier was failing. She wrote to Dreyer, telling him that she had killed her sister Martha and Martha's husband when they had gone to see if the reports about Jit were true. She told him that she dumped their bodies in the swamp to make it look like they died on that journey to Jit's lair. Dreyer said he would send soldiers to collect her other sister Millicent and her husband Giles and take them to the Abbey to make sure they couldn't interfere either. They died there by his hands, but it was by your mother's design. Samantha, you have to listen to the truth, even though the truth is painful. The truth is that your mother told Dreyer that your father was starting to ask too many questions. There was no attack by half-people. They didn't kill your father and capture her. Your mother is the one who killed your father. Samantha's hands fisted at her sides. Lies! All lies! It's the truth. She is the one who killed Zed. She wrote in this book, The old wizard was getting suspicious. She describes to Dreyer how she went about tricking Zed and then killing him. She called him a troublesome old man. You knew Zed. You know what a good man he was. She beheaded him for no other reason than that he was good. It's all here, Samantha. It's all here in her own words. You can have her journey book and read it for yourself. Samantha folded her arms. I told you, my name is Sammy. I thought you had outgrown that name when you took on the responsibility of protecting your village and warning people about the barrier failing. He pointed a thumb back over his shoulder. You helped me rescue all those people back there. You helped me, Samantha. You did the right things, the things the people of Stroiza would have admired. You grew from a girl into a young woman and did the right things. You grew into Samantha. This is the moment you must choose. You can either open your eyes to the hard truth, face the facts, or you can remain a child. This is the moment when you must choose to remain Sammy, the child hiding from truth, or to be more, to be Samantha, a brave young woman I admired. Chapter 24 She folded her skinny arms. I'm Sammy. That is the name my mother gave me. It's what my people called me. Sammy, not Samantha. I don't want the name you want to give me. You have no right to name me. Richard let out a breath. Maybe you're right about that much of it. If you won't hear the truth, even though it is about your mother, especially if it is about your mother, then maybe you are still a girl, still Sammy, and not really ready to carry the name Samantha like I thought. But you can't hide your eyes from the truth forever. I'm not hiding my eyes from the truth. I don't believe anything you say. I don't believe that anything you are telling me really is the truth. I know the truth. The truth is that you're a liar. All those things you're saying about my mother are lies you invented to cover the truth that you murdered her. Why would I want to hurt your mother if she was as innocent as you wish to believe? Why would I want to do that? The truth is I didn't. Richard waggled the journey book again. It's all in here. You can read it for yourself. You expect me to think that proves anything? You got a little book and wrote out those lies yourself. You made it all up to make my mother look bad because she was a nobody from a little village, and you think you are so much more important than us because you are the Lord Rawl. You made it up as an excuse for why you murdered her. Richard nodded. I killed her. But it was not murder, and I don't regret it. I wish it wouldn't have had to be that way, but I don't regret killing her. She was a murderer of innocent people, and she deserved to die. She got what she deserved. I won't apologize for doing what was right. So you say. 
You invented a story to make yourself look noble and wrote those things down to try to cover up your own crime of murder. You murdered a good woman, and now you smear her memory for your own need to be an important man. A big, important ruler over all the people of Dahara. Samantha, we traveled together long enough that you should know me, know my heart. You should know that I wouldn't lie to you. As painful as the truth might be, I would never hide it from you. I'm telling you the truth. You need to grow up and accept the truth. You can't live a lie forever. Just because your mother was evil, that doesn't mean you are, or that you have to uphold a false belief. My father was an evil man. I understand that. I know that I am not him, just as you are not your mother. You stand on your own two feet and make your own way in life. You can still be the woman you thought she was. This is a time when you have to live up to your responsibility as a woman and take up the difficult business of using your head to see the truth that's right here before you, even though it may be hard and even though it may be painful. Samantha lifted her chin. I don't believe your invented stories. They aren't the truth. The truth is that your mother even talks in here with Dreyer about what they should do if you became suspicious. Her gaze shifted to the book and then back to him. What lies did you make up about that? None. You can read it for yourself. Judge for yourself. Dreyer told your mother that she may need to eliminate you like she eliminated the others who became suspicious. Your mother told Dreyer that once the rest of us were taken prisoner here at the Citadel, he was welcome to take care of you himself in any manner he wished, so that you wouldn't become a problem. Her hands fisted at her sides again. She wouldn't do that. She loved me. Richard leveled a stern look on the young woman. You were in chains down in that dungeon because she wanted you in chains. How do you think it happened that you were caught with Colin, Nikki, and me? Dreyer wanted us, and she made sure he had us. She was going to let Dreyer use his occult abilities to torture you to death, the same as he did to so many others who were taken to his abbey, and the same as he was going to do to us had we not escaped. He was ruthless, and your mother let him have you, knowing how brutal he would be in eliminating you. Had we not escaped, you would have been tortured to death along with us, because your mother wanted you out of her way. You were an inconvenience to her. Samantha stood motionless for a moment, only the muscles in her jaws flexing and the tendons in her arms tightening as she fisted her hands even tighter. Suddenly she flung her arms out from beneath the cape and toward him. Richard had hoped she would not react in this way, but he had been ready, just in case. He already had his hand on the sword, letting its power seep through him. When he saw her begin to cast magic at him, he drew the sword in a heartbeat. The unique ring of steel filled the murky air and carried out across the grassy marshland. A bolt of power, crackling and booming like lightning, shot toward him from her outstretched arms. The loud rumble of that lightning shook droplets of water from the grasses all around. Richard, holding the hilt of the sword in his right hand, gripped the blade near the point with his other hand and held the weapon up like a shield. The thunderous explosion of the lightning bolt smashed into the sword, sending a shower of sparks out to the sides as the flashes curled all around him. The sound of the explosion reverberated across the countryside, echoing back from the forested hills. When she saw that Richard wasn't harmed, Samantha growled in rage and cast another bolt of power, this one a bluish-white color and thicker. It crackled through the air, sending off secondary threads of sizzling power as it came, lighting all the grass and rushes in a harsh glare. Richard bent at the knees, bracing for the impact. When it hit the sword, the force of it knocked him back a step. Upon impact, the flash of glowing power, split by the sword, spread in a shower of sparkling light around both sides of him. The scintillating discharge was so hot, it ignited patches of grass and rushes, even though they were wet. Green blades of grass briefly turned an incandescent yellow-orange before crumbling to ash in the heat. An intense inferno whooshed up from those crackling fires, swirling as it rose into the air. The flames died out as the power dissipated. Samantha slowly lowered her arms. Then, staring at something behind him, Richard kept the sword up to shield himself as he looked back over his shoulder at what Samantha was staring at. It was Colin making her way through the rushes, gracefully pushing them aside with a hand as she approached. She finally came to a halt at Richard's side, her noble demeanor looking every bit the mother confessor. Samantha stopped and stared, her eyes growing wider. She had driven a knife through Colin's heart and certainly didn't expect to see her alive. 
I killed you. I know I did. You certainly did, Collins said. Fortunately, Richard kept you from being a murderer. Now he is trying to keep you from forever losing your way. Samantha's expression turned icy calm. It was a look Richard knew all too well. The girl was beyond seeing reason. Her arms came up once more. Now I'm going to have to kill you again, to make him pay. But this time I'm going to make sure he won't be able to bring you back. Richard stepped in front of Colin and held the sword out to deflect a spreading font of blindingly bright orange flame that roared toward them. He and Colin both turned their faces away from the dazzling light and intense heat as they crouched behind the protection of the sword. When they looked back, Samantha was no longer standing there. Richard spotted her just as she disappeared into the shadows, back in the woods. I have to go after her, he said. As he took the first step, a hand snatched his sleeve and jerked him back. No, you are not going after her, Nikki said through gritted teeth, meaning for him to know that she meant it. I have to stop her, he said, pulling his arm from her grip. She will come back after us. Nikki gave him an admonishing look. Richard, have you forgotten that that girl can make all those trees explode? If you go into those woods, she will blow the forest apart, and you with it. We won't be able to find anything left of you to put on a funeral pyre. You would be shredded into nothing. You know she's right, Richard, Colin said. Don't do what she just did and avoid the truth because it's ugly. We have to use our heads. We have more important things to worry about. We need to stop Sulichon, not Samantha. Richard knew they were both right. He couldn't let himself be distracted by Samantha. He had given her a chance to accept the truth. Those who refused to see the truth were not immune from it. Richard finally nodded. I wish I could talk to Red. She saved our lives because she knew what was about to happen with that tower. Colin shook her head. She's gone. Vanished like a ghost, Nikki confirmed. Richard's expression soured. Isn't that just like a witch woman? She helped you all she could, Colin said. It's not her place to help us any more than she already has. Richard let out a heavy sigh. I suppose you're right. Let's go find Moeller, the scribe. We're in the dark about too many things, and that leaves us behind events. We need to get ahead of Sulichan and Hannes Ark if we are going to stop them. There are prophecies here that Hannes Ark somehow used to bring Sulichan back from the dead. I want to know everything he knew. For the most part, we all know what Hannes Ark has done, but key elements of how he did them are missing. If I'm going to stop him, I need to find those key elements. Colin gave him a crooked smile and then put her arm through his as they started back toward the citadel. That's the seeker I know so well. Chapter 25 Up on the top floor of the citadel, Moeller, the old scribe, looked back over his shoulder as he lifted the lantern out toward the oak door. With its heavy iron straps, it looked like it could be a door to a treasure vault or a dungeon. This is the place, Lord Rawl, Moeller said. This is, was, Bishop Ark's study. It's the recording room where all the prophecies have always been kept and where he worked most of the time. Richard wasn't especially happy about getting tangled up in the uncertainties and misdirection of prophecy, but he needed to know what information Hannes Ark had been using as he hatched his plot to bring Emperor Sulichan back from the underworld. It was clear that something he had been using was effective, or Sulichan would still be in the world of the dead. Moeller lifted a finger out from his fist holding the metal ring of the lantern and placed it against the door as he smiled back at Richard, Colin, Niki, and the three moored Sith. Richard thought it was more an apologetic smile than one of pleasure. Like the scribes before me, I've spent nearly my entire life working in here, devoted to the prophecies kept here, tending the old ones and recording new ones that came in for Bishop Ark. Richard glanced from the old scribe to the door. Let's hope there's something in them that will help us to stop the man. The hunched scribe conceded the point with a nod, before leaning down even more to pick the proper key from the ring of keys he always had with him. Long wisps of gray hair did little to cover the top of his bald head, and the blotches of dark spots scattered across his scalp. Richard lifted the lantern from the man's hand to make it easier for him to select the right key and unlock the door. Moeller finally stuck the correct key in the lock and, holding the handle, jiggled it in a way the old lock needed to be finessed in order to make the bolt clang back. He pushed the heavy door inward and retrieved his lantern from Richard before leading them into the room. 
Once inside, cocooned in the lantern light against the darkness, he plucked a long sliver from a small iron cup mounted on the wall near the door and lit it in the flame of his lantern, then let the glass cover back down before rushing around the room, using the flaming sliver of fat wood to light candles and lamps along the way. Each flame added its own little bit of light until the room was fully revealed. There were no windows to allow the night to look in. High beams on the ceiling were all decorated with ornamental carving. The plastered walls had darkened over the ages from the soot of candles and lanterns, leaving them a dark, mottled tan. Lauren closed the door and then stood before it. The other two moored Sith took up posts to either side of the door, guarding it so that no one could disturb them. Considering the size of the Citadel, the recording room was far more expansive than Richard had expected, even though it wasn't nearly as large as many prophecy rooms he had seen before. Since the Citadel was primarily a prison to hold those who had been born with occult power leaking out from beyond the barrier until they could be executed, it seemed strange that so much space would be devoted to prophecy. He supposed that it might not have been intended for such a use when it had been first built, and along the way those who ran the Citadel, like many people, became increasingly obsessed with prophecy. Prophecy, too, even false prophecy, gave those controlling it power over people. Moeller pointed to ledgers lining shelves of tall bookcases to the left side, as if to answer the question in Richard's expression. I believe that originally, many ages ago, this was the place where information from the condemned was recorded. All those books there hold names and family links. I think that those in charge back then used those ledgers as a way to try to contain the spread of any infection leaking from the Third Kingdom. But at some point, prophecy became more important to the people who ran this place, and the ledgers were forgotten, along with the original purpose of the citadel. Richard nodded. I think that the inmates took over the prison, so to speak. Once they were in charge, they came to believe that prophecy was their means of changing their place in the world to one of domination. Prophecy certainly was an obsession of Hannes Ark, Moller confirmed, and he was obsessed with domination especially of the House of Rawl. Why would he be so concerned with the House of Rawl? Colin asked. Moeller turned to look at her. They murdered his family when he was still a boy. Richard nodded. Some of my ancestors murdered a lot of people and made a lot of enemies. Well, Nikki said, changing the subject as she looked around. This is no match for the vaults of prophecy that were once at the Palace of the Prophets. Let's hope that what is here at least turns out to be valuable to us, Colin said. Even with all the candles and lanterns Moeller had lit, the recording room was rather dark and gloomy. But more than that, the place was decidedly strange. An odd assortment of various items stood all throughout the expansive room. Glass display cases held odd collections of smaller objects. Randomly throughout the room were low cabinets, cases, statues, and pedestals grouped in no particular order that Richard could make out. But he did see that everything had been placed in an even grid pattern so that they almost resembled pieces on a giant game board. Around the edges of the room in several places, there were overstuffed chairs, comfortable spots to relax or read. Richard frowned as he scanned the room, trying to make sense of it, but he decided in the end that maybe it wasn't supposed to make sense. Not everything had to make sense. Sometimes people simply put new things they collected wherever they could find space. Most likely, the items, everything from marble statues to a bronze sundial, were placed in the room as they were collected. Collected, though, by a disorderly mind that would put a sundial in a dark room with no windows, as if hiding it from its purpose. Either that, or Hannes Ark found comfort in chaos. They walked slowly, silently, past glass cabinets that held odd collections of items. There were bones from strange creatures Richard didn't recognize, common-looking rocks, small figures made of straw wearing crudely sewn clothes, carvings of people and animals arranged in scenes of country life, and geared mechanical devices the purpose of which Richard couldn't begin to guess. Although those geared devices did remind him in a way of Regula, the omen machine. Regula was filled with complex geared workings, the shelves in the cabinets also held small boxes in a variety of sizes, along with round tubes, with symbols in the language of creation carved all over them. Scanning a few of the boxes, Richard mentally translated some of the symbols and saw that each item told a story, not unlike the scenes depicted by some of the little carved figures. 
Nikki shook her head as she stared into one of the cases. I hate to imagine where Hannah Sark would have obtained some of these rare objects. When she looked at Moeller, he shrugged an apology for not having an answer. He didn't collect all of them. Some of these things were here since I was young. I know that he did add items from time to time, but others were here before I was born. There were also a number of preserved animals in different places around the room. Besides more common creatures in common poses, such as a deer standing in a display thick with dried grass, a family of beavers posed on a mound of sticks, and raptors, their wings spread as they stood on bare branches. There was also a large bear towering up on its hind legs, jaws spread wide in a silent roar, its claws raised so that it looked perpetually ready to attack. In various places throughout the room, conforming to the grid pattern, large pedestals stood in random spots within that grid work, in no apparent order. Each carved wooden or stone pedestal held an enormous open book, each with a heavy leather binding. Some of the books were decorated with gold leaf. Most showed great age and wear, with frayed edges all around their covers. They would have been hard to move because of their sheer size. But because they appeared to be quite fragile, they probably had permanent homes on their pedestals, rather than on one of the bookshelves against the back wall. They all lay open to different places in the volumes, places where the latest entries had been made. Some were opened in the middle, others closer to the end. Only a few lay open near the beginning. Tables near the pedestals holding the books were piled with disorderly stacks of scrolls. Richard unfurled several, and it confirmed his speculation that they were prophecies that had come into the Citadel for Moeller to record in the permanent collection of large books. While a few of the prophecies sounded complex, most were simpler than the typical prophecies he had read. The wax seals on many of the scrolls were unbroken, the scrolls waiting their turn to be opened and recorded. Colin had told him the horror of how Ludwig collected prophecy by torturing captives, it was probable that for some of those scrolls, at least, someone had died at Ludwig Dreyer's hands. It had to be the ultimate terror to be at the mercy of such a madman. And yet, strangely, it appeared that Hannes Ark was in no particular hurry to see all the new prophecies lying untouched. Richard was beginning to suspect that something else must have commanded the man's attention, which meant that, for Hannes Ark at least, the prophecies were not the most important thing in the room and not what occupied most of his time. Something else was. Richard wondered what that something else could be. Moeller swept a hand of gnarled arthritic fingers around, indicating the open books. This has been my life's work, Lord Roll. These are the books where I recorded prophecy collected from out in the Darklands. With a kind of reverent affection, he let the hand settle on one of the open books. These books are where I would write down all the prophecy brought to the Citadel, as scribes before me had done for generations. Did all of these prophecies come from Ludwig Dreyer? Richard asked. Actually, only a small portion came from Abbot Dreyer. He believed that he was the bishop's most important source of prophecy. But actually he wasn't. Most of the scrolls and even ledger books are brought in from various places around the Darklands. A number of emissaries from the Citadel traveled the towns and more remote areas out among the villages and the cunning folk to collect prophecies from anyone with the talent for such foretelling. Once each foretelling arrived back here, I recorded it in these books. You wrote all these books? Colin asked. Oh my, no, he said with a short chuckle. I work with these books, record into them, but they predate me by many centuries. They contain the work of a long line of scribes who came before me, going back several thousand years, almost to the time when the citadel was built, I believe. All of it is recorded here, as did those before me. I have worked at this my entire life. Since I was young, I have entered new prophecy in these books, most of that time for Bishop Ark. Knowing what he knew about prophecy, Richard was having a hard time believing that these books of recorded prophecy were the source of Hannes Ark's knowledge and power. Prophecy, especially what he suspected was more folklore than true prophecy, could not provide that level of expertise. How do you choose which book to record these new prophecies in? Nikki asked the scribe. Was that also your job, to decide where they belong? He looked somewhat puzzled by the question. They are categorized and then recorded according to their subject. 
I record them in the proper book for the subject contained in the prophecy. Richard shared a look with Nikki before he gazed out over the books lying open all over the room. I was just starting to organize the prophecies at the People's Palace, but it takes a true prophet to read the prophecy first and determine the proper subject. Really? Moeller asked, his eyes brightening. I had no idea you were interested in such matters. Bishop Ark never cared much about the mundane aspects of my work. He only cared to read the new prophecies once I recorded them. Are there many books of prophecies there at the People's Palace? Richard arched an eyebrow. The books in this room would not fill one small corner of one of the smaller libraries. There are a great many libraries there, some of them by themselves as large as this citadel. Moeller's eyes widened. Really? I would love to see such a sight one day. I hope that someday you can, Richard said. He frowned, getting to what he really wanted to know. Why aren't the prophecies here recorded by chronology rather than subject? Chronology is ultimately what matters. After all, a prophecy is irrelevant if it's about an event that took place a thousand years ago or will take place thousands of years from now. You need to know where a prophecy fits in time to know if it is relevant to what is happening today. Prophecy can only be linked and, more importantly, put in context if it can be placed chronologically. Moeller looked befuddled. I rarely have any way of determining chronology, Lord Rawl, so I must instead use the subject as the category. That is how it has always been done. Richard didn't want to tell the man right then and there that his life's work had not only been misguided but was virtually useless. He couldn't let it go entirely either. The subject of the written words is misleading unless you're gifted and can confirm that the subject as written is actually related to the underlying prophecy. Are you gifted? Moeller touched a finger to his lower lip. No, Lord Roll, but I can read, so I know the subject. Richard shook his head. The problem with that is that the words are not really the prophecy. The old scribe's eyes widened. They aren't? But how can that be? The meaning of the prophecy is hidden in a layer of magic beneath the words. What most people don't understand is that the words are not actually the prophecy. They are only a trigger for the meaning of the real prophecy. A prophecy, for example, that says it will rain may actually mean it will rain blood or a bounty of good crops. It takes a prophet to be able to see the vision of the real prophecy veiled by the words. The words are what trigger the vision. They don't actually reveal it. Moeller looked about the room at his life's work, seeming confused and lost, probably for the first time in his career. Even using the words, Nikki said, prophecy often contains references to a number of subjects. How do you determine which subject book to record them in? I had to do the best I could, mistress. I used my experience and judgment, Moeller pointed. For example, all the prophecy in that book is about the House of Rawl, a subject of great interest to Hannes Ark. He looked up at Richard. Do you mean to say that my entire life's work is meaningless? That the categories are meaningless? Richard sighed as he looked around at the books lying open on pedestals. I can't say for sure. All I can tell you is that prophecy says I'm the one who is supposed to end prophecy, whatever that means. So I guess that ultimately, if I'm successful, none of this will mean anything. Isn't that something? Moeller whispered to himself as he stared at all the books, as if seeing prophecy for the first time in a new light. And to think, Bishop Ark spent so much of his life in here. What bothered Richard most was that if Hannes Ark didn't help in the assignment of prophecy to particular books... That could only mean that the man wasn't as interested in these prophecies as Moeller believed. Something else had been the focus of Hannes Ark's attention and the source of his knowledge. The people who used all this didn't really know what they were doing, Nikki said, being more forward about it than Richard. From what you say, she told Moeller, the things collected from anyone with the talent for foretelling means that most of this would be false prophecy. He looked alarmed. False prophecy, mistress? Nikki nodded as she looked around at the books. True prophecy comes from wizards, prophets, not from country folk who imagine they have such talent and dream up prophecy. Those kind usually have a head full of predictions that come from dreams, wishes, fears, or most often their fertile imaginations. True prophets are wizards, and wizards in this day and age are exceedingly rare. Prophecy among wizards is even more rare. Prophecy is meant to be read by others with the gift, at least, and especially by other wizards who are gifted for prophecy. True prophecy is a specialty of wizards, not regular people. Moeller was frowning with concern. 
You mean this in here is not true prophecy? Nikki shrugged. If you make enough predictions, eventually you will get one right. But that is by accident, not design. People focus on the one that turns out correct and from that give credibility to the others they believe have simply not yet come to pass. But forget about the hundreds or even thousands like them that have been forgotten because they have proven to be false. This looks to have become an obsession of a few in the beginning who didn't really understand prophecy, and they passed on their beliefs in this kind of prophecy to those who came after them. It's akin to superstition, nothing more. At the Palace of the Prophets, I worked for a great many years with the prophecy kept down in the vaults. It was prophecy written by wizards who were true prophets. I can tell you from experience that while there might be a few gems here, most of it is just common rocks. Richard was thinking the same thing. He wondered what Hannah Sark had really been doing in this room. If this prophecy was largely useless for the purpose and of little value, then how did Hannah Sark learn to raise Emperor Sulachan from the dead? Chapter 26 Richard turned to the scribe. Where did Hannah Sark work most of the time? You said that he spent a great deal of his time working in here. What did he do? Moeller shrugged uncomfortably. I was not privy to exactly what it was he did. He did not discuss such matters with me. I was only his scribe. I do know, though, that he liked to study old documents. At least that was what I most often saw him doing. I started early in the morning recording prophecy in the books here, and he usually came in later. He did a lot of his work in here at night after I was gone. The old man lifted an arm out toward a large desk off to the side of the pedestals that held the books of prophecy. The disorderly desk was piled with everything from decorated bone objects and simple candlesticks to rulers and dividers to papers and stacks of old scrolls. A fat candle in a silver stand rested on top of a stack of worn ledgers. By the way, layers of candle wax dribbled down all over one side of the ledgers. Their importance appeared to have been nothing more than as a stand to elevate candles. Sometimes he would go over to the books and read prophecy I had recorded. I assumed that he did that when I was gone as well, but I can't actually say for sure. I can't say that I ever saw him paying close attention, though. I think he merely scanned them, looking for anything that might warrant more of his attention later. When I was here, he occasionally liked to play chess. The scribe gestured to a small stand with a board set with black and white game pieces. Over there, he turned back. Mostly, though, he worked there at his desk. Standing behind the broad desk, Richard noticed that the closest pedestal, the one not far away on the other side of the desk, was the one holding the book that Moeller said contained prophecies about the House of Rawl. Just beyond that book of prophecy, rising up behind it, Hannah's Ark would have had a good view of the stuffed bear standing up on its hind legs to tower over the book. The man probably liked the symbolism. In that light, the placement of objects in the room was beginning to make a little more sense. Hannah Sark seemed to be a man fixated on symbology. The books of prophecy around the room were immense, not only physically, but also in that there were collectively thousands upon thousands of pages contained in them. The thought of studying all of those books to try to find out what Hannah Sark had been up to, or to find a hint that might be helpful in stopping him, was daunting. Small numbers of prophecies were difficult enough to consider. The numbers here were overwhelming. But he didn't think that prophecies collected in such a suspect manner were really what had occupied Hannah's Ark. Richard turned his attention back to the desk and unrolled a brittle, ancient-looking scroll lying to the side of the desk. The vellum was stained with what looked to be centuries of dirt and dark ringed stains from mugs and candles used as weights to hold it open. Richard was stunned by what he saw written in faded ink. Niki did a double-take when she saw the look on his face. What is it? What do you see? Richard could only stare at the scroll covered with a complex tapestry of lines connecting constellations of elements that made up the language of creation. He moved to the side a little as Niki and Colin rushed around the desk to have a look for themselves at what had captured his attention. That's the language of creation used by Regula, Colin said. The omen machine gives prophecies in that language. Richard nodded as he scanned the symbols, already trying to work out the translations. It's also the same language used by Naja Moon to leave messages in the caves in Stroisa. I wonder if that means they date back to the time of the Great War, the time when Naja and Emperor Sulachan were alive, Colin said as she leaned in, frowning at the scroll Richard held spread open on the desk. What does this say? Rather than answering her, he straightened and looked over at Moeller. Are there any more of these scrolls? Ones written in this same language? 
Holler stretched his neck to glance across the desk and looked down at the scroll. He appeared to recognize it. Yes, there are some more of them. He pointed. There is another one of them there in that pile. It's that darker one. Bishop Ark called them Cerulean Scrolls. Cerulean Scrolls, Richard asked. You're sure? Yes, that's right. He could read them, but I can't. He spent a great deal of his time working with them. Whenever a new one came in, he spent all his waking time with it for weeks. But that was a rare event. He was very protective of them. Years ago, he used to study every detail of the new prophecies that I recorded for him. Although he would still come over from time to time and scan the newest entries I had made, over the years his interest in the books of prophecy dwindled until he became almost entirely focused on the scrolls. Sometimes he used those instruments on the Cerulean scrolls, doing some kind of measuring and such. If he worked late into the night and left them out, then in the morning when I came in I would put them away for him. But other than that, I never had anything to do with them. Colin looked up from the scroll. Do you know what Cerulean means? Moller shook his head. That was what he called them, but he never told me the meaning of the word. It's an ancient word, Richard said. It means celestial. Nikki's brow twitched. Celestial? Richard grunted confirmation as he idly pinched his lower lip, deep in thought about the things he had seen in the room where Hanasark spent most of his time. The place contained dusty artifacts from ages ago, most appearing to predate Hannes Ark's time. While the place was chiefly dedicated to cataloging and recording prophecy, the man hadn't bothered to open all the newly arrived divinations. Since he apparently didn't read them closely, it would seem that Hannes Ark wasn't all that interested in prophecy, or possibly he understood that the kind of ungifted prediction that arrived daily at the Citadel was not true prophecy and largely useless. It appeared that the Cerulean Scrolls were the center of his focus. Richard wondered if perhaps Hannes Ark was only seeking out prophecy as a pretext to send people in what was really a search for scrolls or books written in the language of creation. The Dark Lands, after all, seemed to be rich with history from the time of the Great War. The caves at Stroiza were covered with information from that time. Sometimes, Moller said, when I arrived in the morning to record prophecies that had come in overnight, Bishop Ark would still be in here working on a new Cerulean scroll, and I would notice then that he had acquired more of those strange tattoos. Bishop Ark didn't like me to speak unless spoken to, so I never asked about them. When we played chess, I didn't like to look upon those frightening symbols tattooed all over him. Nikki hooked a long lock of blonde hair behind her ear as she leaned over to get a better look at the scroll on the desk. Was he good at chess? Moeller nodded. Oh, yes. He was a master at it. So then there are more of these kind of scrolls, with symbols like this one here? Richard asked as he impatiently waved a finger at the scroll. These Cerulean scrolls, there are more of them. Moeller seemed a little bewildered by Richard's interest in old scrolls. That's right. Some are written in languages that are slightly different but are similar enough. All of them are kept over there. He gestured to a cabinet against the stone wall. Let me show you, Lord Rawl. The man shuffled across the room, weaving his way between a display of a family of stuffed beavers to one side and a marble statue of a woman in a filmy robe that left nothing to the imagination on his other side. Richard noticed that from his desk, Hannes Ark would not have been able to see the statue very well, but he would have had a clear view of the scene with the beavers, all busily at work chewing tree trunks and reducing them to sticks and small logs to use in their dam building so they could control the flow of a stream. When he reached the cabinet, Moeller opened the tall carved door to reveal a grid of cubby holes, almost every one of them holding at least one scroll, some stuffed with several. They looked as ancient as the one on the desk. Many had dark, crumbling edges. A quick appraisal suggested that there were probably close to a hundred cerulean scrolls in the cabinet. Richard pulled one of them out and carefully unrolled it to have a look. It began with azimuth angles that he didn't recognize. Those celestial observations, he suspected, were meant to show star positions. Richard wasn't entirely sure how, but he suspected that it might be a way of establishing chronology, a key element that prophecy lacked. In that light, the scrolls made prophecy look amateurish and incomplete. It seemed to have been an advanced technique, the mastery of which had been lost over time. Right at the beginning, after the information about azimuth angles, Richard saw symbols that spoke about prophecy, except that they weren't giving prophecy. 
Rather, they spoke of prophecy itself, almost as if it were a living thing. In a strange way, they were revealing prophecy, but only in an oblique manner as they spoke of specific prophecies, using what they said to explain the central subject of the scroll. What exactly the subject of the scroll might be, Richard wasn't entirely sure just yet. Since in the language of creation, each of the symbols formed a complete concept, similar to an entire written sentence, rather than merely a word in a different language, it would take more time to work out the meanings of all the arcane symbols. Richard rolled the scroll back up and handed it to Niki. He pulled out another and opened it wide between his outstretched arms. This one, too, was written in symbols. And although the language was very similar, it was not exactly the language of creation. It was substantially the same, but more arcane, more primitive, written in a kind of less formal slang. Richard felt a chill run through him at the realization that it seemed to be a language that predated the orthodox form of the language of creation. A quick look was enough to tell him that he should at least be able to catch the gist of it, if not translate it in its entirety. As he scanned the symbols, they too appeared to be about prophecy, but in a different way. He frowned as he studied the scroll, trying to figure out what it was saying. Look here, Niki said, leaning in and pointing at a symbol. Isn't that the symbol for Regula? Richard blinked with the realization. It certainly is. He rushed to try to read what the scroll was saying about Regula. Right off the top of his head, it wasn't making a lot of sense. His sense of alarm was making it difficult to think clearly. Niki leaned in, pointing again. Look at this formula. Richard puzzled at it. I don't think I've ever seen it before. Something about death, but I don't know what it means. I recognize that particular set of expressions, Niki said. They were used by Sisters of the Dark. They have to do with the underworld. She looked up at him out of the corner of her eye. It's talking about the world of the dead. I see it now, Richard said, nodding as he unfurled more of the scroll. It's speaking of banishment. Banishment? Colin asked, peering around the side of him at the scroll. Banishment to the world of the dead? You mean like the Temple of the Winds was sent to the underworld? Goose flesh tingled along Richard's arms. No, not to the underworld. This has to do with a banishment from the world of the dead. Banishment from the underworld? Colin shook her head. What could that be about? I don't know, Richard said as he rolled the scroll back up and started pulling others out of the cubby holes, holding them in the crook of his arm. Help me take them over to the desk. How many do you want? Niki asked. All of them. Colin looked over at him. All of them? Yes, bring them all over to the desk. This is what we came to find. It's not the prophecies that hold what we're looking for, it's these Cerulean scrolls. This is what Hannah's Ark used to bring Sulachan back from the dead. Are you sure? Colin asked. Richard waggled one of the scrolls. Why do you think he has these symbols tattooed all over himself? It has something to do with the scrolls, not prophecy. The scroll has elements and symbols linked to occult magic. It mentioned regula. It's all tied together with what's in these scrolls. I need to know what all of them say. I need to get to work to translate them to find out what Hannah Sark knows and what he is doing. Richard, Collins said in a confidential tone, we don't have time for this. He stopped pulling scrolls out of the cubby holes to look at her. What are you talking about? The sickness you carry. We have to get it out of you or you are going to die before you can use any of this to stop Sulachan and Hannah Sark. You need to be cured first. Richard went back to pulling out scrolls and stuffing them under his other arm. We can't make it to the People's Palace in time. I told you that before. It's too far. But maybe there is another way. Maybe these will help us to solve that problem in a different way. As he rushed to pull scrolls out of the cabinet, he saw Colin and Niki share a look. He understood their concern, but he knew he had a limited amount of time before the poison grew strong enough to stop him from thinking clearly. It wouldn't be long after that until it killed him. He knew, too, that even in the best of circumstances, they couldn't make it to the People's Palace in time. Even if they made it there, Sulachan's half-people would already have the plateau surrounded, preventing them from being able to get in. They couldn't fight their way through all of Sulachan's forces. He started back to the desk with his armload of scrolls. The others followed behind, carrying their own armloads of scrolls. He needed to find out what was going on. He needed to know how Hannah's Ark had brought Sulachan back through the veil. Such things weren't supposed to be possible. The dead were supposed to stay dead. He knew that those answers were the key to everything. For that matter, 
Even though there were some unique circumstances involved, it shouldn't have been possible for Colin and him to come back to life. And yet, they had. It all made sense, and yet, it didn't. Not really. He suspected that those events were related to everything else taking place with Hannah Sark and Emperor Sulichan. Richard remembered the Bone Woman, Aidy, telling him about the Skrin being a force that was a part of the veil between life and death. That force guarded in both directions. The force of the Skrin repelled all from the cusp where the world of the living and the world of the dead touched. The Skrin kept the spirits in the underworld from crossing back into the world of life. So how did Sulichan cross back? Richard needed to find the answer to that question. Chapter 27 As she came down the hall, walking through patches of early morning light coming in the windows, Colin could see Vale and Lauren both wearing their red leather, standing at their posts before the door to Hannah Sark's recording room. They would have been there the whole night, making sure that no one could disturb Richard. Men of the first file stood guard everywhere in the halls of the Citadel, always at the ready for any trouble that might arise. On her way back from the kitchen, Commander Fister had asked Colin to come get him if she needed anything. She had assured him she would. Vale reached out as she stepped away from the door, offering to take the tray. No, it's all right, Colin said. I have it. Vale moved back out of the way to let Colin through. Did you get any sleep, Mother Confessor? Colin nodded. Yes, thankfully. It had not been enough, but it had been better than nothing. How about you two? Vale gestured to Lauren. We took turns resting a little now and then. Colin didn't believe that for a moment. The Mord Sith would not have left their posts guarding Richard for anything, especially now that there seemed to be a heightened sense of urgency to what he was doing in the recording room. Mord Sith didn't know much about magic or about ancient scrolls for that matter, but it was not at all difficult to tell that Richard was stirred up over the discovery. Colin had been up for ages, it seemed, the anguish of returning to the world of life only to learn that Richard had given his life to send her back had been beyond endurance. The realization that Richard was dead had denied her the ability to sleep except fitfully. After that, the effort of helping Niki when she went to the underworld to bring him back had been strenuous on top of having so little sleep. And then, the euphoria of having Richard return from that dark realm had been muted by Kara giving her life to make it possible. The wild swing of emotions had been draining. The relief of at last having Richard back was tempered by the fact that the poison of death still infected him, to say nothing of the ordeal of standing all day beside Kara's funeral pyre. Colin had been near to dropping from exhaustion. Her lack of sleep had begun to make it nearly impossible for her to think clearly any longer. When Richard told her to go get some rest, she hadn't had the energy to argue. She wanted him to come with her and get a few hours sleep but he said that he had to stay and work on trying to understand what was in the scrolls and what they might have to do with everything that was happening. She'd reminded him that he needed sleep in order to think clearly. Richard had told her that he'd gotten a good long rest while he had been dead. That made her smile. With Niki and the three moored Sith saying that they would stay and watch over him, Colin had given in and made her way back to the bedroom to get some sleep. She'd fallen asleep almost as soon as she hit the bed. It hadn't been as restful as she had expected or hoped, probably because she missed having Richard there beside her. Even as short as it had been, it had at least done her some good. It smells delicious, Lauren said of the eggs and bacon Colin had on the tray. Make sure Lord Rawl eats it all. He needs his strength if he is to be the magic against magic. Colin smiled as she nodded. I asked some of the workers down in the kitchen to bring you up some as well. They should be along shortly. I want you to eat, too. You three need your strength to be able to protect him. As she opened the door, Lauren promised that they would be sure to eat. Inside the quiet, windowless room, Cassia looked over from her post beside the door. Colin saw Niki curled up in one of the overstuffed chairs, sound asleep, with one arm draped over the side. The scribe, Moeller, had gone off to bed just before Colin and had not yet returned. How is everything? Colin asked in a whisper so as not to wake Niki. Cassia glanced at Richard briefly before answering. I can't say for sure, but I don't think things are going well. Concern tightened Colin's brow. What do you mean? Cassia pressed her lips tight as she considered how to explain it. I don't know. It seems like he is in a really bad mood. A bad mood? Why? What happened? Nothing really. I can't exactly put my finger on anything specific, Cassia said. 
I don't know him well enough to know what he is like most of the time, but just from as long as I've been with him, I don't think he is usually this upset. From what I am able to gather, I think he's angry about something he is reading. Did he say something? Colin asked the Mord Sith. No, nothing. Cassia drew her hand down the long, single blonde braid she had pulled over the front of her shoulder. But I can see the muscles in his jaw flex from time to time as he grits his teeth. Once I saw his knuckles turn white because he was gripping the hilt of his sword so tightly. Colin didn't at all like the sound of that. Well, maybe having something to eat will make him feel better. Cassian nodded. I hope so. He needs his strength. I can hardly believe that we have him back. I want him to get over his sickness and be well. I want him to be with us forever. From knowing Kara so well, Colin understood what it meant to the Mord Sith to have a Lord Rawl like Richard come into their lives. Colin lifted Kara's ajeel hanging on the chain around Cassia's neck. I understand. I am a sister of the ajeel. Cassia, her eyes widening, tilted her head forward. You are? Really? Colin smiled as she nodded. Sisters of the Ajil know what is best for him. We all have to stick together in order to take care of him. Cassia flashed a conspiratorial smile. You have that right. At the desk, Colin set the tray down to the side, out of Richard's way. The sun is up, she said. Well, it's actually too cloudy to see it, but it's light out anyway. I brought you breakfast. Richard glanced up briefly to give her a perfunctory smile. Have some food, Richard. You need to eat. Without argument, he briefly glanced over at the tray and retrieved a piece of bacon. He munched on it as he continued to study the scroll laid out on the desk before him. A candle in a heavy silver base held down one corner, a lantern the other. More scrolls lay in disorderly stacks all over the desk. Beyond the desk, the stuffed bear stood on its hind legs, towering over them, claws raised as it glared in a frozen, menacing roar. Once he finished the bacon, Richard kept reading. Colin handed him another piece. He took it, offering a grunt of thanks, and kept studying the scroll without looking over. Colin leaned a hip against the desk and folded her arms. So, have you learned anything? Too much, he muttered. What does that mean? It means, he said, without looking up at her, that I'm beginning to wish I wouldn't have come back from the world of the dead. Colin took hold of the wooden armrest and pulled his chair around so that he was facing her. She was not going to be ignored. When he started to protest, she put a fork full of scrambled eggs in his mouth. You need to eat to keep up your strength, she told him. Fighting off that poison inside you is a constant effort. You need to eat. He chewed as he watched her eyes. She knew he couldn't argue the point. Without pause, she scooped up more eggs and fed them to him each time he swallowed. When he had finished eating most of the eggs, she handed him the cup of tea and smiled. Good? He took a swallow, his gray raptor gaze staying on her the whole time. Yes, thanks. I didn't realize how hungry I was. He gestured vaguely to the disorderly stack of scrolls. I've been absorbed in all these. Now that he had stopped and eaten something, she expected he would be more forthcoming. So, do you want to tell me about it? He finally let out a deep sigh. I don't know. I guess I feel like the whole world has been turned upside down. It turns out that the things I've learned in recent years, and I thought I knew, hardly even scratched the surface. They were true, but only in a way, and only as far as they went. It turns out that nothing is like what I thought. I had no idea of what was actually going on beneath the surface, or even how much there was beneath the surface. I feel like I've been kept in the dark. Really? Kept in the dark for how long? Remember the day I first met you in the Heartland Woods and I told you that some men were following you? Of course. Since then. Colin gave him a smiling admonishment. Richard, it can't be that bad. Look at all we've overcome already. Besides, just because you're reading something in these scrolls, that doesn't mean it's true. How many times have we thought we understood something because of what we read, only to find out later that it wasn't true? Unfortunately, this has proven to be true. How can you be so sure? Emperor Sulichan would not be back in the world of the living right now if it weren't true. You wouldn't be alive if this were not true. I wouldn't be alive. I had no idea of how much more there is to what is going on than I thought. What's not like you thought? Everything. Chapter 28 Everything, Colin repeated. Such as... 
Richard leaned back, letting out a deep sigh as he drummed his fingers on the arm of the chair, apparently considering where to begin. Do you know where prophecy comes from? He began. Colin thought it an odd question. Real prophecy comes from prophets. Dead prophets. Colin tilted her head forward. What are you talking about? When a prophet, a wizard gifted with prophecy, goes into a trance and prophecy comes to him, that prophecy is coming from dead prophets in the underworld. That is the source of prophecy. Colin gaped at him a moment. You can't be serious. Richard looked up from under his brow. In the language of creation, the symbol for prophecy can be translated in two different ways. One meaning of the symbol is prophecy. The other translation is the voice of the dead. He turned to the desk and swept an arm over a scroll held open at each side with ledger books. These scrolls are full of information about the nature of the world of life and the nature of the underworld. I never imagined that this much comprehensive information could be contained in one place. There is more information, important information, in these scrolls than all the libraries at the People's Palace. It's like everything we've ever found before, everything we've ever looked for, everything we've learned, only scratched the surface of what these scrolls contain. Colin didn't like the sound of that. Such as... Richard wearily rubbed the tips of his fingers against his temples. Everything that has happened ever since I met you, for that matter, everything since you and I were born, is in here. These scrolls tie all the loose ends together. They tie everything together. Everything? Colin couldn't fathom what he was talking about. Richard, I'm not following what you're getting at. Everything, like what? He looked up at the ceiling. Where do I even begin? Pick a place and start, she said in as calming a voice as she could muster. His head came down and he fixed her in his gaze. Everything, from the boxes of Orden to Sulachan to Regula to Hannes Ark, to me, is tied up in all of this. I don't even know where to start or really even how to begin to explain it to you. Colin folded her arms. Take it one thing at a time, Richard. Start with Regula. What does it say about the Omen Machine? Richard peered up from under his brow. Regula is part of the power of the Underworld. In a way, it's death itself in our world, in our midst, in the world of life. She held up a hand to stop him. Back up. It's buried under the People's Palace. Where did it come from? She asked, trying to be as patient as she could to get him to calm down. How did it get there? Richard tapped the side of his thumb on the desk for a moment. I'm not exactly sure yet of the whole explanation. There are a lot of Cerulean scrolls left to go through. I understand, but you said that it was in a way death itself in our midst. You must have a reason for saying that. What does that mean? He leaned forward. Regula, its power, what makes it alive in a sense, was banished to the world of life, banished from the underworld. Colin made a face. Banished to the world of life? From the underworld? I'm sorry, Richard, but I don't understand. Well, remember how the wizards back in the Great War banished the Temple of the Winds to the underworld to protect the dangerous magic it contained? Colin had some pretty unpleasant memories of the Temple of the Winds. It would be impossible for me to forget that even if I tried. Well, Richard said, using his hands as he talked, part of the bargain... The balance for that was that the world of life had to take the power of Regula and keep it hidden here. Colin squinted at him. Wait, what is it? What is Regula? What is the power that was banished here? It's the collective power of prophecy from the underworld. Having it in this world powers prophecy. It enables prophecy to come into this world. It propagates prophecy. Colin pressed her fingers to her forehead, pausing for a moment. She couldn't begin to fathom what he was talking about. You're saying that the reason we have prophecy is because Regula is here in this world. Richard gave her a single firm nod. Yes. Colin couldn't believe he was serious. At the same time, it was frightening that she could see he was. She flicked a hand toward the scroll. Richard, it sounds to me like what it says in those ancient scrolls is just myth. You know, a form of morality tale set down on ancient scrolls. You've heard such fables before from people in the wilds, remember? She circled a hand in the air, 
gesturing toward the sky, weaving the story the way people in the wilds always did. Stories about how the sun and the moon were once lovers, and they created the grasslands as a secret, sacred place where they could be together. They say that is how the world came to be. It was a place created where the sun and the moon could lie down alone together, away from the stars. That's why the people there, like the mud people, have such reverence for those plains, believing that the grasslands are sacred because they have been kissed by the sun and the moon. Their story about the sun and the moon and the grasslands beneath them is a fable meant to teach innocent children to respect the land. It's a morality tale. They don't believe it literally happened. Collins swept a hand toward the scroll. That's what this sounds like to me, like a cautionary tale, a fable. A caution to beware of prophecy and not let it rule your life. I bet that's all the scrolls really are, Richard. Fables. He stared at her for a moment. The scrolls talk about the ancient power of Orden. Probably in fable form as well. No, not in fable form, but explicitly, he said, cutting her off. It explains what happened, what I did. It explains how Orden works, what I was going to do, and why I did it. The power of Orden apparently predates the scrolls, and yet they talk about it, about the events that would surround it into the future, and they talk about me. Colin leaned toward him, her eyes widening, these ancient scrolls speak of you? Well, he said with an offhand gesture, not specifically, but yes. They don't mention me by name exactly, but they are talking about me. Remember the prophecies that spoke of me as the bringer of death? Of course. It's like that. They use names like that for me. Names we've seen before, like the pebble in the pond. Names that can only refer to me. For example, they say that the bringer of death will use the power of Orden to initiate a phase change. A what? What's a phase change? Richard paused to gather his thoughts. The power of Orden predates these scrolls, but the people who wrote the scrolls knew a great deal about the subject. Among other tools, they used prophecy extracted from the underworld to help them in the understanding of the structure of Orden and all it touches. They explained that the power of Orden can bend the nature of existence. Remember the book on Ordenic theory that I found? Remember that it mentioned the power of Orden held in those boxes had the power to distort the nature of existence? Colin cocked her head. You mean the way you bent existence to bring worlds together into the same time and place, in order to banish the followers of the beliefs of the Imperial Order to their own world without magic? Yes, exactly. Richard flattened one side of the scroll on the desk and tapped the place on it near the far end. It calls that event a spectral fold. He looked up at her. The power of Orden initiates a spectral fold, meaning it distorts the nature of existence. That's how I was able to bring places together in the same place at the same time. It's called a spectral fold. Collins shrugged. Well, that was a good thing, right? It ended the war. Richard shook his head. It bought us time in one phase of events. It ended that war, and that was a good thing, a necessary thing. But in so doing, it started a greater war. Through the series of events caused by the initiation of that spectral fold, the great war from back in Magda and Merit's time was fully reignited. That war was not merely a war between the New World and the Old World, but more importantly a war between the world of life and the world of death. Those were the battlefields. Those were the factions involved. The war we fought and won was with the remnants of that conflict. We were only fighting at the fringes of the greater war between the worlds of life and death. I used the power of Orden to end that particular war with the Imperial Order in that particular manner. But a spectral fold touches all of existence. Not only what I did to banish the followers of the Imperial Order. That spectral fold that I initiated may have been absolutely necessary, but it is still in force. The Cerulean Scrolls call this spectral fold a star shift because it shifts the nature of everything, the very nature of existence, of the world of existence, which encompasses the whole world of life. I used the power contained in those boxes, releasing it to end the war. In so doing, I initiated a spectral fold, a star shift. That was what the creator of the sword knew had to be done despite the cost. That was why he made the key. They knew it would initiate a star shift, and they knew the cost would be the spectral fold that would bring about the final battle that I would also have to fight. It was, in a way, a prophecy that had been pulled from the underworld in order to create the situation needed to force the event. They created a self-fulfilling prophecy? In a way, 
but only as a tool for the power of Warden so it could do what it was meant to do. Colin felt like her head was spinning. What else? What else does this power, this star shift, affect? The veil. Colin felt goosebumps raise the hairs on her arms. The veil. Yes. The veil is the power, the force, that keeps the world of life and the world of the dead separate. It's that line in the grace that separates life and death. Those worlds can't be allowed to mix. The veil protects that from happening. That power is what Adi knew as the Skrin. Remember her telling us about the Skrin? The power of the Skrin is the power contained in the veil that keeps the spirits on that side. It keeps the dead dead. But the spectral fold, initiated through the power of Orden, not only weakened time and space in order to bring the two separate worlds together so I could banish the people of the Imperial Order to that other world, it also weakened the veil as well. In a way, what I did with the separate worlds coming together in time and space is the same thing that is also happening with the world of life and the world of the dead. The only difference is that the veil is a much larger force because it separates existence from non-existence, so it has taken it longer to begin to show the signs of this weakening. That, and also, since the underworld is involved, that time factor is distorted. Time is meaningless in the underworld. That weakening of the veil is what allowed Hannah's art to bring Emperor Sulachan back from the dead. That weakening of the veil is also what enables Sulachan to reanimate the dead. Richard tapped a finger against the scroll. Hannah's Ark learned what the results of the weakening would be from these scrolls. The creators of these scrolls learned what would take place from prophecy, which they extracted from the underworld. In turn, the scrolls predict what Hannah's Ark and Sulachan would do as a result of what I did with the power of Orden. Colin was having trouble fitting it all together, and even more trouble grasping all the implications. Dear spirits was all she could say. Yes, but all things work toward balance, and that is the important takeaway from what the scrolls are saying. Events can fall off toward one side of that balance or toward the other, because the contrasting sides work toward balancing each other. How was all she could ask? The balance to the harm that Hannah's Ark has the potential to do is that the weakening of the power of the veil because of this spectral fold also allowed me to travel to the underworld in order to send your spirit back to the world of life. It allowed Niki to come into the underworld to get help for me. It allowed Zed and all the others already there to help find me and free me from Sulichan's dark ones. And it allowed me to return to the world of life. It balanced out the things Hannah's Ark does because I am the force meant to balance what he and Sulichan are doing. The balance to Sulachan coming back to the world of life is me being able to return as well to be here to fight him. And, in a larger sense, it's all part of a greater balance. There is prophecy in the Cerulean Scrolls. Wait, I thought you said the prophecy came from the world of the dead. How can the scrolls contain prophecy if they predate Regula, and thus prophecy being in this world? Because they draw information directly from the world of the dead as well as the world of life. They are celestial scrolls. So, in a manner of speaking, they draw from the void of the night sky as well as the daytime sky. In other words, they draw from both sides, from all there is on both sides of the veil, from both worlds. Just as wizards of old had additive magic as well as subtractive magic, the gifted back then, the ones who wrote these scrolls, had abilities beyond what you or I can fathom. They had not only regular additive and subtractive magic, but it was combined with the opposite of occult magic. They wielded power in both worlds. They drew from a world where time exists and from where it doesn't. Cerulean, meaning celestial, also refers to the star shift, which is this spectral fold initiated by the use of the power of Orden. I'm the one who initiated its spark. You mean it's kind of like starting a campfire to keep you warm and cook your dinner, and that much is good, but then a big gust of wind comes up and blows sparks everywhere and catches the entire forest around you on fire. So what started off good turns into something very bad. Richard grimaced a little. That's one way to put it, but in this instance the entire world is on fire. Colin pressed her hands to the sides of her head. This is giving me a headache. Richard grunted a brief chuckle. You don't know the half of it. I've only scratched the surface. It's a lot more complex than I'm making it sound, and so far I've only given you a few of the meaningful highlights. Colin lowered her hands and stared at him. You mean to say that there's more? I'm afraid so, Richard said, and it gets worse.
Chapter 29 You see, Richard said, Hannes Ark knew all this. He apparently got his hands on some of these scrolls long ago and read in them about initiating the power of Orden to create this spectral fold. He collected more of these scrolls over time and has been using what he was able to learn in them to start shaping events to his own objectives. He saw from what he read that this was his opportunity to bring Sulachan back. Hannes Ark is the one who gave Dark and Raw the last box of Orden, Colin said, trying to keep track of it all in her head. You mean he did that to help start this prophecy to unfold? The prophecy he plays a central part in and that he would benefit from? Exactly. He has been moving the pieces around like pieces on a chessboard in order to bring about the events the scrolls talk about. It's as if he sees prophecy of himself doing these things and then does them to make the prophecy reality. Moeller said that he was a master chess player, and from what I've learned about the game, much of the thinking in the game carries over to making moves in life. He wanted to open this gateway through this spectral fold because he needed Sulachan's help to conquer the world of life. So he put the boxes in play by giving the third box of Orden to Darkenrawl. He was making moves that had repercussions later on, all down the line. He knew from the scrolls that giving Dark and Rawl the last box he needed to put them in play would trigger the events in prophecy. Unlike us, he knew from the scrolls what the power of Orden really was. Hannes Ark was moving upon, knowing from prophecy that if the boxes were in play, I would defeat Dark and Rawl and therefore go on to become the Lord Rawl leading the Daharan Empire that would then be drawn into the war against the Imperial Order. He knew that I would use the power of Orden to end the war with the Imperial Order which is a part of the larger great war that Sulachan started so long ago. After all, Sulachan created the Dreamwalkers. Emperor Jagang was a descendant of those Dreamwalkers created by Sulachan so that he would start the war that I would end by using the power of Orden that Hanasark would then use once the star shift weakened the veil to bring Sulachan back from the dead. Colin pressed her hands to her head. Dear spirits, and they were using this knowledge of the use of Orden all along? Richard nodded. Hannes Ark had already moved that pawn long ago by giving the box to Dark and Raw to begin the chain of events that would eventually get me to use Orden's power, because he didn't have the key to it. But the scrolls said I would, which would in turn get him what he was ultimately after, to be ruler of the world of life which would get Sulich on what he wanted by being able to come back from the world of the dead, which he helped engineer by creating the Dreamwalkers, and so on and so forth. But then he was carrying out prophecy that hadn't happened yet, she protested. He was creating prophecy, in effect. He was creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Richard showed her a smile. Exactly. You see, prophecy is an underworld power. Wait. How can it be an underworld power? You said that before, but I don't think that can be right. Prophecy comes from prophets predicting the future. Hannes Ark saw that prophecy and took the actions he did in order to make sure everything was in place for it to happen as in the prophecy. But the prophecy itself came from the underworld in the first place, Richard said. Prophecy is an artifact of the world of the dead. Colin shook her head. Prophecy is given by prophets in this world, not the world of the dead. Richard leaned toward her in a meaningful manner, so we always thought. And that is the key to it all. I don't follow what you mean. Richard gestured to the scrolls. Prophecy actually originates in the underworld, from the spirits of the dead, and prophets in the world of life are able to channel those prophecies in this world. Colin took a deep breath to fortify herself against her growing frustration. I don't understand. How could they originate there, in the world of the dead, from spirits? Richard leaned forward again, almost with delight at what he had discovered. This is where it starts to get complicated. Starts? Richard, I don't... He held up a hand. Hear me out first, and then the bigger picture will all start to make sense. She pressed her lips tight and remained silent so he could go on. She knew Richard, and she knew he didn't go off on pointless tangents. The underworld is eternal, which makes it timeless, he began in a calm voice. We've always understood that much of it. Time has no meaning in an eternal world because there is no beginning and no end of time there. So there is no way to measure a segment of forever, right? 
Colin conceded the point with a nod. Right. One day or a thousand years is the same, because with no beginning and no end, there are no units of measure for time there. No limits to measure a day, a year, a century. So? So, in the underworld, where nothing changes and there is no future as such, because there are no boundaries and no units to measure time, the future is the same as now. There can be no tomorrow, so there can be no future as such. The future in the world of the dead takes place in what the scrolls call the eternal now. Colin scratched an eyebrow. The eternal now? That's right, the eternal now. In the underworld there is only now. Richard held up a finger to make a point, reminding Colin very much of Zed when he did so. Time is a concept that only has relevance in this world, where there are beginnings and ends to things, days, years, lives. In the underworld, a soul never dies. It is eternal. The underworld does not have those things needed from which to construct the concept of time. There is no yesterday in the underworld because it's eternally the same there. Eternally unvarying, eternally changeless. So there can be no such thing as yesterday. By the same token, there can be no tomorrow, right? The sun does not rise and set there. It's always the same. There are no days there. Nothing to mark time. No end of time. See what I mean? It's all an eternal now. Since now in the underworld is an eternity, the eternal now... There is no future as such there, because in a place with no markers for time, such a thing can't be delineated. This means that what we would think of as happening in the future, here in our world, in the eternity of the underworld, actually happens in this homogeneous soup of the eternal now. We think of events happening in our future, because in our world we have time, a today and a tomorrow, but you can't think of it the same way there. Colin stared off into the memory. I remember when I was there in the underworld. I don't recall any sense of how long. I was only there, always, forever, unchanging. Exactly, he said. In the eternal now of the underworld, those events which all take place in the eternal now all happen together and are the purview of a power known as regula. Regula, you might say, is the sum of everything. Everything that can happen, everything that will happen. Once the power of Regula was sent to this world, imprisoned in that case, buried in the people's palace, it compressed the future. What we know as prophecy, because it hasn't happened yet, into the now, our present, because to Regula, there is no future, no past. Regula, being an underworld power, can't differentiate between today and tomorrow, or today and a year from today. It only knows everything that will happen, the totality of events, but since it's an underworld power, it has no real concept of time, so it doesn't know when those things will happen, or which one of them will happen, for that matter, because everything is in a state of constant flux. So, to Regula, when it says the ceiling will fall in, that event has already happened. It's not predicting. It's reporting. Colin folded her arms, squinting, trying to reconcile it in her mind. That doesn't make any sense. I don't understand. Prophecy is a compression of the future into the present. Everything that takes place continually alters the totality of what Regula knows. It contains events without the quality of time. Without time, there is no future. So it is all happening now. That's the specific power that Regula controls, the eternal now. Colin gave him a look from under her brow. And that is what the scrolls call it? The eternal now? Yes, here, it gets more complex, so you need to let me get through this part and then you'll see how it all fits together. Colin nodded for him to go on, making an earnest effort to listen with an open mind. The underworld is timeless, with everything there in the eternal now, right? But here in this world, where there is time, if you reveal the future, then there really is no future as such. You are pulling the future backward to right now. This is an aspect of the underworld, not the world of life. Prophecy compresses what will happen into what we know right now, into the eternal now. But that is an underworld quality, and it doesn't belong here. Richard could apparently see by the look on her face that she was lost, so he came at it a little differently. In prophecy, the future is revealed to us now, right? If we read a prophecy about an event in the future, say a queen having a child, then that future event is pulled backward from its rightful place of where it will happen in the future back to today. 
See what I mean? So now, when you read the prophecy, you are reading what will happen, so that future has, in a way, become real right now. That's why it's called the eternal now. Without time in the underworld, it's all one long eternal now. Here, though, it's a perversion of the nature of time in our world. It's a corrupting element, an underworld element. Here in this world, future events aren't supposed to happen now. That is an underworld contamination leaking into our world. That's why I've always instinctively hated prophecy, because prophecy is actually a component of the underworld. Prophecy is an element that, in its natural state, does not contain an element of time. It belongs in the world of the dead where it came from, where there is no time. It is part of death itself. I've always instinctively recognized prophecy as carrying death within it. The reason I instinctively recognized that is because I'm the one. Colin tilted her head toward him. The one, you mean the pebble in the pond? Yes. The balance to prophecy is free will. Now we can understand for the first time exactly why. Acting on free will preempts that eternal now by pulling the future away from the eternal now, pulling timelessness away from it by canceling the prediction with the use of free will. Human choice. Free choice is the counter to prophecy. It's a living aspect, the balance to the dead aspect of prophecy. Prophecy is an element of the world of the dead, while free will is an element of the world of life. The wrinkle in this spectral fold was created by events long ago, but in the underworld, those thousands of years are in the eternal now. So the spectral fold, the star shift, initiated by my igniting the power of Orden, does not simply ripple through space with the spectral folds. It ripples through time. Colin gestured to the desk. But all those things you did to trigger these events were predicted in prophecy and written in these scrolls. Richard gave her a cunning smile. Of course they were. Sulachan sent the prophecy to this world, through prophets in this world, so that they would write it in the scrolls, so that Hannes Ark would read it and initiate it all by putting the boxes of Orden in play. It is all part of Sulachan's grand plan. He began laying the groundwork for it when he was still alive. You see... At some point, long past, before Sulachan ever came along, the good spirits in the underworld, knowing the danger, wanted to protect the power of Regula from being misused. So they sent the power to this world and hid it for safekeeping. Or so they thought. But because Regula is part of the eternal now and exists in that eternal now, there is no accurate way of telling exactly when Regula actually appeared here in this world. What those spirits didn't know when they sent it here was that this power created a breach between worlds, allowing prophecy to cross over through it from that world. Without Regula being there in the underworld to contain it, prophecy continued to leak through the veil along the lines of the grace. So then, she said, those good spirits didn't actually do the good thing they thought. By sending Regula here, they created a terrible problem. Richard shrugged. They exist in the eternal now, where all possible futures exist. Perhaps they saw future gaining strength that was more terrible and more dangerous than we can imagine, so they hid Regula in this world to choke off that terrible future. For all we know, had they not done so, maybe the world of life would have ended thousands and thousands of years ago. Anyway, for whatever reasons those good spirits had at the time, Regula was sent here to this world. Because of it being part of the eternal now, it doesn't behave the way we would expect something here to behave, so there is no way of knowing precisely when it actually came into being in this world. What is known, though, is that sometime later, after it was already rooted here in this world, Sulachan found out about it, and he sparked its power, using it to ignite a firestorm of prophecy flooding into this world. All the thousands of books of prophecy written since the Great War that we've found in libraries are the flames of that conflagration a hidden, smoldering part of Sulachan's plan. This is how he brought the House of Rawl and then Hannes Ark into his web to help him in his struggle. Wizards came along, prophets who tapped into the stream of prophecy flowing along the lines of the grace and, thinking they were doing good, channeled these predictions, which unbeknownst to them were flooding through the veil from the underworld. Without knowing it, they were tapping into the eternal now and poisoning our world with underworld power. As long as Regula is in this world, as long as it lives, it will continue to poison this world with prophecy. 
Chapter 30 Colin rubbed her arms against the chill of beginning to grasp the enormity of what Richard had discovered. It was also overwhelming that it was making her feel very small and insignificant, as if she were but a speck of dust in the vast universe. She supposed that was all she really was. I almost hate to say it, Richard, but it's starting to make sense. It touches on vague doubts I've always had, things that just never seemed right. For the first time in my life, all of these doubts and questions are starting to make sense. Good. I'm relieved that you get this much of it because there is more, and understanding this foundation will help with the rest. Richard took a breath before going on. The underworld is not touched by creation, so it is not created. Rather, it is chaos in free form. You might say, since it is death, it is the opposite of creation. It is anti-creation. It is neither good nor bad. It has no integral nature to define it. It has no inherent order. It is merely a timeless void that is, in a way, shaped by the souls that exist there. Prophecy, being a power partly involved, certain elements of the grace, is expressed by the souls in the underworld existing in the eternal now. Touched by the grace from the moment they came into being, they continue to be connected to it even as they cross over through the veil. That's how the spirits, the souls of the dead, who exist in a world where prophecy is all part of their eternal now, channel it back through prophets in the world of life. It follows those lines of the grace that cross worlds separated by the veil. Some of those souls are good, some evil, some brilliant, some fools, just as they were in life. Our souls, you see, are the sum total of who we are, good, evil, brilliant, or fools. That means prophecy is the product of both brilliant and ignorant souls, good and bad souls, choosing those things in the homogeneous soup of the eternal now which fit their inherent nature. They gravitate toward those outcomes which their soul embraces. It all mixes together into the prophecy that becomes the power of regula. That collective intellect pooled, the web of life and the spirits, creates what the celestial scrolls call the time wave of prophecy. All of the predictions are true, but all can't be. Colin wiped a hand back across her face. If it can't all be true, then how is it resolved? It isn't. That's the point. In the eternal now of the underworld, it doesn't matter. It's all part of the homogeneous soup of the eternal now, but here it all spins out of control and collapses. It's one of the powers that doesn't belong in this world. It's incongruous. But it is leaking through the veil because the veil is weakened by the spectral fold. What's called the twilight count measures this degradation of the veil. Colin cocked her head. The twilight count? That measures how much the veil is weakening? Yes, that's right. The twilight count was begun, like turning over an hourglass, by the initiation of the star shift of the spectral fold. You could say that the twilight count is the sand in that grand celestial hourglass counting down our existence. The death of this world through the spectral fold degrading the veil will devour the world of existence and thus our souls. Prophecy is the leper's bell betraying that open gap between the worlds. The very existence of prophecy is a dire warning that the sands of the twilight count are running out. Prophecy is contaminating the nature of time in our world and that contamination is measured by the twilight count. Colin blinked in alarm. How much time do we have? To answer that question, we would need some kind of zenith formulas called breach calculations from the star shift. You mean to say there was previously one of these star shifts? She asked. It's happened before? Apparently. The scrolls are vague about the previous events, but they mention needing, among other things, templates for occulted celestial charts called seventh-level rift formulas if you are to work out these worldly timelines for this star shift. I haven't the faintest idea what any of that means, where to find these things, or how to work them if I did. Colin looked over at the sleeping sorceress draped in the overstuffed chair. What about Nikki? Would she know, do you think? Richard sighed as he shook his head. She was just as mystified about that part as I was. Except she did say that by the nature of such things, she could tell that it would require the use of my gift to work any such calculations. So even if I had the components, I couldn't make them work. But it really doesn't make a lot of difference anymore because we know from everything else, such as Sulachan being back in this world and the barrier to the Third Kingdom being down, that we are rapidly running out of time.
What is happening now is an end phase. While it seems that prophecy has been here forever in the stretch of cosmic existence, prophecy has been coming into this world for only a brief twinkling of time. Now that it has, the timeless nature of the underworld is stealing time away from us, stealing existence from us. Prophecy is the open link that is draining away our free will, our lives, our existence. Colin snapped her fingers. That's what it means when it says you can only save us all by ending prophecy. Richard smiled that she saw it. Exactly. It really means that I need to end prophecy in this world by closing the bridge between worlds that has been opened up. Opened by you? Yes, Richard conceded. When I used the power of Orden, that was the initiating phase of everything that was long ago set into motion when Sulachan sent the prophecy out from the world of the dead. The entire thing is tightly woven together with thousands of different threads. Richard drew a deep breath. And all of those threads are linked to me. Colin swept some of her hair back off of her face. So if you end prophecy, you are really sealing the spectral fold and completing the star shift. He nodded again thus letting life begin a new era. That page needs to be turned. Life reset. The open conduit of prophecy must be closed. Only in that way can the star shift be complete. When that happens, life will be reset in a new phase. Life will then be able to go on. And without that happening? Richard raked his fingers back through his hair. If I can't end prophecy, then the veil will continue to erode away which is what Sulichan has been working toward, and everything will be consumed by the chaos of the underworld. Because he has understood all of this and has been able to direct so much of it, Sulichan believes himself to be the master of the underworld, I guess you could say. He thinks this will unite it all into one world, life and death existing together, and he will rule over this new world of souls. But what he doesn't understand or doesn't care about is that when the veil finally fails completely and the worlds come together... Everything, even the eternity of the underworld itself, will end. It will be a form of death for everything, except the underworld can't die as such since it's already dead. So what happens is that everything, the world of life and the world of souls, will simply wink out of existence. How can eternity end? Colin asked. It's eternal. Think of it this way. A shadow exists because of something casting it. If the thing that casts the shadow ceases to exist, then the shadow ceases to exist. Richard shook his head. Only so long as everything is in balance, as long as life and death, these two opposing forces are separated by the veil. On its own, without the world of life, the eternity of the world of the dead is a contradiction, like a shadow with nothing casting it, and contradictions can't exist. In other words, how can something be dead if there is no such thing as life? The world of the dead is defined by the world of life, so once the world of life ends, the underworld ceases to exist. No world of life, therefore no world of the dead. How can it end, she asked, if there is no such thing as the concept of an end in the underworld? It wouldn't exactly end, because technically there is no existence in the underworld to end. It will all simply cease to exist. It will be as if it never existed. Like a shadow vanishes without an object to cast it, no trace would be left behind. The eternal now will wink out as if nothing ever existed. He leaned back in his chair, drumming his fingers on the desk. Unless, of course, I can stop it from happening. Colin nested her hands in her lap, feeling overwhelmed. You're dying, Richard. You have the poison of death in you. How are you going to do anything to help us if you die? Richard considered his answer for a time. When he spoke, he spoke in a quiet but forceful tone. I am inextricably woven into the fabric of this, in a number of ways. From using prophecy, to using free will, to using the power of Orden to stop what would have happened had I not. I couldn't not have used the power of Orden. Prophecy grows old and corrupt over time, becoming infected with branches that never took place, or false prophecy, or evil prophecy. Such defective prophecy infects life with that underworld power that is pulling the world of existence apart. Wizards, gifted individuals, have become rare where once they were common. The gift itself is fading away from mankind. 
Subtractive magic has virtually vanished from those few who do have the gift. The world has been dying for thousands of years, and we never realized it. Or at least, never realized why. Prophecy is the talisman that marks everything being taken into oblivion. I'm the only one who can stop it. I must stop it. Colin wiped a hand back over her face. She was beginning to see more of the links the more she thought about it, the way everything was inextricably connected. But he still hadn't answered her question of how he would be able to stop any of it if he was dead. How are you connected with Sulachan? she asked. He looked up from under his raptor brow. I'm the living bridge that enabled Sulachan to cross over, in much the same way that Kara was the living bridge that allowed me to cross back through the veil. My blood, the blood of the bringer of death, brought the dead man back. And Hannes Ark, how is he linked into this? He is basically taking advantage of it all for himself, but in so doing he enables it to happen. For all I know, the end of the Twilight Count may take a lifetime, or even ten lifetimes, before it runs out. He wants to rule the world of life in the interim. And why would Sulachan help him? Richard leveled a look at her. I'm the living bridge, but Sulachan needed someone on this side to initiate the elements necessary to bring him back. He needed someone on this side of the veil to move the pieces on the chessboard, so to speak. Hannes Ark has the occult powers and the detailed knowledge that were required to accomplish such an extraordinary task. Colin lifted her hands in a gesture of frustration, only to let them drop back to rest on her thighs. Red told me that Sulachan and Hannes Ark are like two vipers, each with the tail of the other in his mouth. I can see that Hannes Ark needs Sulachan's army of half-people to help him take over the Taharan Empire and rule the world of life. But now that Emperor Sulachan is back in this world, what does he need with Hannes Ark? Richard met her gaze. You know those tattoo symbols all over Hannes Ark? Of course. He gestured to the scrolls. Those tattoos are elements of occult magic laid out in these scrolls. They are part of how Hannes Ark was able to pull Sulachan out of the underworld. But he's back now. Why continue to indulge the man? Richard smiled. Those spell forms tattooed all over the man are the only thing keeping Sulachan in this world. They are his anchor. At the same time, those spells are Hannes Ark's armor, protecting him from being harmed by Sulachan. Until he can finish breaking the veil and uniting the world of the dead and the living, he still needs those living spells in order to remain in this world. They secure his spirit here in the world of life and keep the spirit king from being pulled back into the spirit world by the power of the Skrin. If Hannes Ark dies, those spells lose their viability. My blood brought Sulachan here, but those spells all over Hannes Ark keep him here. Colin blinked in eager astonishment. So then... If someone kills Hannes Ark, that would get rid of Sulachan at the same time. Maybe a force of men of the first file? Colin snapped her fingers. Maybe archers could take him down from up on the plateau when they come to lay siege to the people's palace. Both of them are protected by powerful occult powers. Richard looked away and tapped a thumb against the scroll for a time before answering. Only a warheart can stop Sulachan, and only a warheart can kill Hannes Ark. Colin wasn't sure she had heard him right. A uh, what? Richard pulled a scroll out of the pile on the side and unfurled it across the desk. He tapped one of the symbols. This symbol, here, means Warheart. It says in this scroll that the only one who can send Sulachan back to the underworld, kill Hannes Ark, and end prophecy, to seal the spectral fold to complete the star shift before the twilight count trickles down to the end of everything, is the one it calls the Warheart. Colin gave him a look. Don't tell me. It's someone we know. Richard nodded. The bringer of death. The pebble in the pond. And all the other names that have identified me over the ages. A war heart is an ancient name for a specific kind of war wizard. It's a war wizard who has led a war, who has wielded a sword in righteous anger. And a few other requirements. Like what? Only a unique war wizard is the true war heart. That kind of war wizard who has war in their heart must possess the balance to that. Colin frowned. What is the balance to having war in your heart? The love of one who is virtuous. I am the bringer of death. You are what balances all of those things in me with the meaning of life, 
with what life is about, with what is worth fighting for, with love for you, and in turn love for life. You are my soulmate. You complete me. You make me whole. All of those things make me complete in the fight for life. They made me go to the underworld itself to fight for you. And that is the last requirement that names me the Warheart. The scrolls say that only the one who has willingly gone to the world of the dead to take the place of the one he loves is the true Warheart, who can end prophecy and close the spectral shift to reset life on its new course, free from the reach of those in the underworld. I'm the one with war in my heart, a war wizard, and the only one who can bring death to those two vipers and to prophecy. They fight to rule. In part because of my love for you, I fight instead for what is right and noble about life. That's why these Cerulean scrolls name me the Warheart. Chapter 31 The only problem, Richard said into the silence, is what you mentioned, that I have that poison in me which means my gift doesn't work, so I don't know how I'm going to be able to do any of those things that need to be done. He lifted a hand and let it fall back to rest on top of an opened scroll. Without my gift, against these kind of enemies, I don't have the weapons I need. Cullen wiped a tear from under her eye as she stood. You have your mind, Richard. How many times did Zed tell you that is all you need? Your mind is your weapon. It always has been. It's what has figured all this out. He smiled a special smile just for her, and that was answer enough. His heart was in the fight. The war heart was committed to the fight. What I remember, he said, is Zed telling me that nothing is ever easy. Has it ever been? No. He smiled again, this time with a hint of sadness for his grandfather. I guess not. Colin folded her arms as she paced a short distance and then back. Nikki was still asleep. Having helped Richard translate the scrolls for most of the night, Colin knew that the sorceress would already know most everything Richard had just explained. Cassia, over by the door, having heard everything Richard had said as well as what he and Nikki had discussed during the night, looked like she was proud to be the Mord Sith protecting the Warheart. When had Mord Sith ever had the chance to fight for a Lord Rawl who, in turn, fought for them? He truly was the magic against magic. Except that for now, his magic was out of his reach. Colin finally slowed to a stop before him. We have no choice, then. We are going to have to race as swiftly as possible back to the People's Palace. We need to get to the containment field. You can't do any of those important things you've learned about in the scrolls if you're dead. We have to get the poison out of you first. Richard raked his fingers back through his thick hair. I know it sounds like that would be the solution, Colin, but it's simply too far. I can feel how the poison is advancing in me, and I know roughly how much time I have, and I know how long it would take to ride to the palace. We wouldn't make it in time. And that's even if we could ride right in, without having to first get past Sulachan, Hannah Sark, and all those half-people. Colin spread her arms in frustration. What choice do we have but to try? You won't live long with that poison in you, and if you die, then Sulachan wins. We have to try, Richard. Maybe the poison won't work as fast as you think. After all, you said that being in the underworld caused it to regress some. Maybe it slowed its advance enough for you to make it to the palace in time. Besides, you have to make it. You said yourself that the scrolls say you are the balance, the counter, to what Sulachan and Hanasar intend to do. They do say that, Richard told her with a sigh as he glanced over at the scroll lying open on the desk, but they don't say which side will win. Well, you can't win if the poison kills you, now can you? That means we have to get there in time, she insisted. That's all there is to it. Everything depends on it. As the silence dragged on, Richard rose slowly out of his chair. He wore an expression that Colin knew all too well. It was a look that told her that some inner calculation had been running through his head as he tried to fit all the pieces of the puzzle together. The look on his face told her that he might have just found the missing piece. While it was a look that meant he had thought of something, in the past that something had not always been what she wanted to hear. It was a look that meant some crazy idea had just come to him. It was a look that usually meant trouble and sent them off in a direction she had never expected. But she also knew that those crazy ideas he came up with often ended up being the solution they needed. What? She took hold of his arms, looking him in the eye. What are you thinking? 
Rather than look at her, he stared off into the distance, lost in thought and not really hearing her. Colin recognized that, too. She knew he was still making mental connections, running through all the possibilities, going down roads and pathways and blind alleys, trying to see where they all led. He was trying to see if there was another way, or if he really had found the right course to guide them. It was not unlike what she had learned one did when playing chess. You didn't make the move until you had exhausted every possible outcome that you could think of. Of course, sometimes that move still resulted in you losing because you hadn't thought of the one fatal possibility. It's too far, he said to himself with an odd frown. He finally looked down at her. You said it yourself. We have to get there in time. But it's too far to get there in time. What of it? Time. He grabbed hold of her arms in the same way she had taken hold of his. There wouldn't have been enough time for them, either. Who? Colin squinted her bewilderment at him. What are you talking about? Richard ignored her as he rushed over to the chair where Niki was curled up asleep. He shook her foot. Wake up. Niki, wake up. The sorceress jerked awake. What is it? What? What's happened? We're leaving. Niki wiped her eyes and then looked at Colin for an explanation. Colin shrugged. Cassia, Richard called out. She leaped forward. Yes, Lord Roll. Go find Commander Fister. Tell him that I said we need horses, for us and a dozen of the men. Extra horses we can switch out as well. We will need to leave at once. And tell him I want the guides we used before, the men who grew up in the Darklands, to come with us. Cassia looked confused. We are leaving? Where are we going? Move, he yelled at the woman. There is no time to waste. Do it now. Get going. He called her name when she was almost to the door. She turned back. And get Moeller, he added. Tell him that I need him. Cassia quickly clapped the fist to her heart before turning and racing out the door. The other two moored Sith peered around the edge of the doorway, looking back in to try to see what the yelling was all about. Before they had time to question, Cassia snatched them by their arms and turned them around, telling them to help her find Commander Fister and the guides. All three raced off down the hallway, past bewildered soldiers of the first file. Did he tell you about Warheart? Niki asked Colin as Richard paced off a ways, once again completely absorbed in thought. Yes, and the highlights, as he put it. Niki's blue eyes turned back to Colin after watching Richard pace between the desk and the door for a moment. I know it all sounds far-fetched. I had my doubts about the whole thing at first, but I have to tell you, Colin, the more I read, the more I realized he's right. About all of it. I've been reading and studying prophecy and prophetic theory for most of my life. I've never looked at any of it in this light before. For that matter, I never even imagined it in this light before. I feel like I'm starting to understand prophecy, really understand it in a fundamental way for the first time in my life. So you're convinced that prophecy really does originate in the underworld? Niki looked over to watch Richard pace for a moment. Before everything we read during the night, I would never have believed it. It isn't simply reading it, though, but reading it all in context. Reading all the explanations of how things are connected, going back to the time before the Great War that Emperor Sulichon started. Now, I can't believe that I never suspected any of this before, including the part about me. Colin's brow twitched. About you? The sorceress nodded, about me taking him to the old world being part of the prophecy in the scrolls. I don't know about that part. He hasn't had the time to tell me everything, Colin said. Niki held up a finger, asking Colin to have patience and wait. Richard, Niki called across the room, what have you thought of? What's going on? He hurried over to them. I'm not completely sure yet. I see, Niki said. So we are going to get on horses and race back to the People's Palace. You're right. That makes the most sense. It wasn't a question, and she obviously knew that wasn't his intent. Niki obviously knew that Richard had no intention of trying to ride to the palace in time. He was too dead set against it. He had thought of something else, but wasn't saying what. Colin was a little amazed that Niki knew exactly how to get his actual intent out of him. What is this place for? he asked Niki. He held an arm up and gestured around. This citadel, why is it here? Niki clasped her hands behind her back, playing along, if reluctantly. It's a prison outpost. It was meant to hold for execution anyone who had occult powers, because that power could only have leaked out of the barrier to the Third Kingdom. 
Executing them was the only way to stop the spread of the contamination. If not stopped, it would be the same as the barrier itself failing. Right, he said with a nod as he looked back and forth between them. And what then was the purpose of Stroiza? Colin shrugged, answering this time, It's a first line of defense. Meant to send a warning that the barrier has been breached and the half-people and those with occult abilities are escaping. They are meant to watch, and when the barrier to the Third Kingdom failed, they were supposed to go to Idendril and warn the Wizard's Council at the Keep. There hasn't been a Wizard's Council at the Keep for ages, but the people of Stroiza didn't know that, he said. They still think the Council rules the New World. So how were they going to get there in time to warn everyone before the half-people attacked towns and cities, or reached the Keep first? The people on the other side of the barrier were from the Old World. They would have headed for the seat of power, just as Hannes Ark and Emperor Sulachan are doing now. Except back then, that was the Wizard's Keep, not the People's Palace. So, how were the people of Stroiza going to manage to do that, to get to the Keep first, before the hordes of half-people? I guess they would have to hurry, Colin said, not quite following what he was getting at. The people of Stroiza live in a remote area that isn't near roads or even good paths, he said. Colin shrugged. That's because the people back in the Great War put the Third Kingdom in the most remote area they could find. They wanted it as far away from civilization as possible. Richard nodded. That's right. But, even so, there are roads closer to the barrier than Stroiza going back in that direction. Even the paths that are near Stroiza go to other places, for the purpose of trade and supplies, not toward Idendril and the Keep. The people of Stroiza live in caves and don't use horses. As Esther told me, Stroiza is their home, and they have nowhere else to go, so travel isn't an important part of their lives. Maybe they used to travel, Niki said. It could be that they forgot to keep horses in the same way they lost so many of the things they were told when Stroiza was founded back in the Great War. After all, they don't even know how to read all the messages left for them on the walls of the caves, because they lost the ability to read the language of creation. We can use horses, he said and we won't be able to get there first. That's only because they have a good lead on us, Colin said. Yes, but even if we caught them, we have to worry about getting past them. They have incredible numbers, many with occult powers. They have a spirit king risen from the dead. They have thousands of half-people, tens of thousands. They're spread out across the land. Worse, Sulachan can reanimate as many of the dead as he needs. He's a wizard with great power. He can use occult abilities. So how was one lone person from Stroiza supposed to get past all that, keep from being captured, and get to the keep in enough time for them to mobilize forces to protect people? By the time the people in Stroiza would realize that the barrier was breached, it would be too late to get to the keep in time to warn them. Niki scratched her cheek. That does seem like a pretty ill-conceived solution to the problem of the barrier. Richard nodded especially since the people back in the Great War, the ones who built that barrier in the first place and put the dangerous half-people and occult powers they couldn't destroy behind the wall, knew that it was eventually going to fail. They didn't put Stroiza there in case it failed. They put it there because they knew it was going to fail, and they wanted us to have ample warning to defend ourselves. They didn't take the threat lightly. They wouldn't have let the fate of the world depend on such a tenuous method of warning people. Colin was frowning in thought. When you put it that way, it doesn't make much sense. She looked up. So what are you thinking? You believe they had some other way to warn people? I do. Before he could say more, Commander Fister rushed in, holding his sword against his hip to keep it from flopping as he ran. He had several men with him. Colin recognized the men as the scouts who grew up in the Darklands. Chapter 32 Lord Roll, what is it? The breathless commander asked. Are the men getting horses together? Of course, Lord Rawl. They are being packed with supplies now. Are we to take you and the Mother Confessor back to the palace at long last? Richard waved off the question as a dead issue. No, we would never make it, just as the Guardian at Stroiza would never have made it. The commander frowned as he panted, catching his breath. He glanced at Colin and Niki before turning a puzzled look on Richard. Where are we headed then? We are going to Stroiza. Colin knew that was where he wanted to go. She just didn't know why. Stroiza, 
Back across that forsaken, trackless wilderness and over the mountain passes we crossed to get here? Irena said that there were roads and trails she used to come here before. I don't know if she really did come here, but she may have been right about there being roads. He turned to the three men. Is that true? Are there roads and trails we can use to get to Stroiza rather than go back across those mountains at Savedra's back door? Without having to think about it, the three nodded. There is a pretty good road part of the way, one of them said, but partway there it starts heading off in the wrong direction. From that point, though, we can take trails used by merchants as trade routes. That will at least get us close to Stroiza. It's not the easiest of trails, but far easier on horseback than going back over the mountains on foot and having to hack our way through uncharted wilderness. All right, then. We need to leave at once. The commander clapped a fist to his heart. As you wish, Lord Roll. All the men can be ready to go before you get down to the stables. Richard looked over at the desk. No, we're not all going. I need the men to split up. I only want to take a detachment of a dozen or so men. More will only slow us down. The commander cleared his throat. I beg to differ, Lord Roll. Not one of my men would slow us down. They would sooner die of exhaustion than slow you down. Besides, you will need their numbers if we're attacked by any more of the half-people. Richard flashed the man a brief smile. I understand your concern. He gestured back at the scrolls. But these scrolls are incredibly valuable to me, to all of us. They have already been in the wrong hands, and that has resulted in all the trouble we now have. We must keep possession of those scrolls at all cost. They are to be protected with our lives. Eventually, they will have to be taken back to the People's Palace, where I will need them. Until then, they must be guarded. The commander scratched his scalp as he glanced over at the desk piled high with scrolls. Do you want the men to start back with them now? Off behind the hulking commander, Colin saw the scribe, Moeller, hurrying into the room. He came up behind the soldiers and stopped, waiting to be summoned. Richard urgently motioned him forward. Yes, Lord Roll, what can I do for you? I need you to collect all the Cerulean scrolls, including the ones that have similar symbols on them, and get them all packed up so they are safe to travel. They arrived in leather tubes that protected them from the weather, Moeller said. A number of scrolls will fit in each one. If they are rolled tightly together, it would not take more than maybe ten or twelve of the tubes. Are they waterproof? Moeller glanced over at the scrolls. Enough to protect them from rain and such, but not enough if you were to drop them in a river or plunge them underwater. They are very ancient, Lord Roll, very fragile. All right, Richard said to the man. Pack them carefully for traveling, then seal the lids with pitch and wax to better protect them. It will also keep them from being opened. Then take them back to the palace, Commander Fister asked. Richard considered a moment. Not yet. They would be more vulnerable when traveling. For now, they would be better protected here. This place is a fortress, after all. Hannah Ark and Emperor Sulitan have no reason to come back here. For now, I want the bulk of the men to stay here and protect them. The commander clearly looked reluctant, but didn't argue. As you wish, Lord Roll. And make sure that the men understand that these are incredibly valuable to stopping Sulichan and the half-people. These scrolls must never again fall into enemy hands. The commander clapped the fist to his heart. I will make sure they understand the importance of their mission. Good, Richard said with a nod. They will be guarded here for now. But when would you like them taken to the palace? When I succeed at stopping Sulichan, then it will be safe to travel with them. If I don't succeed, well, I guess in that case it won't matter much. Commander Fister didn't understand, but neither did he question. Lord Roll, if I may ask, I would like to lead the men who are to go with you. These scrolls may be valuable, but they are not as valuable as you. You and the Mother Confessor are my primary responsibility. I would ask to be at the head of the detachment you take to Stroiza. I would feel a lot better if I was there to help protect you. Of course, Richard said. He leaned to the side, looking past the commander to the three moored Sith. I want you three to come with us. Cassia frowned. What made you think we would have allowed you to leave us behind? Chapter 33 Colin was glad to be leaving the Citadel. It had been a place of sadness and tragedy. Kara had died there, as had a number of others. The fact that Richard was once again back with them in the world of life could not erase the indelible horror of seeing him lying dead, of seeing him on his funeral pyre. But more than any other, it was the memory of almost giving the order to ignite his funeral pyre that kept creeping back into her mind. 
She knew that the memory of the order she had come so close to giving would haunt her as long as she lived and be the rich fodder of nightmares. She mentally shook off the memory. He was alive, and that was what mattered. She couldn't dwell on the past or on what might have been. She had to focus on what was and what they needed to do from here on out. She was also glad to leave the Citadel because of the scrolls that Richard had discovered there. She was still disturbed and upset over everything they had revealed. They had contradicted much of what she had learned growing up and been taught by wizards about how magic fit into the world. The scrolls, though, had skewed her understanding of everything, to the point that she felt lost in a world she thought she knew. Her understanding of everything had been turned upside down. She would like to dismiss the things Richard had told her, refuse to believe what he had discovered and attribute it to myth or far-fetched theory, but she knew she couldn't do that. Not only did she trust in what Richard was able to translate and figure out, but Nikki too, served to validate everything Richard said. Nikki had a great deal of trust and faith in Richard, but she cared enough for him not to allow him to falsely believe something if it wasn't true. Besides, in a very strange way, Colin found the new knowledge to be comforting. She supposed that was because it all had the ring of truth to it. But as disturbing as that truth might be, it was also exciting to have discovered a previously unknown mechanism responsible for so much that everyone simply took for granted. It was like peeking behind the curtain of creation. It was fascinating in the remarkable clarity it brought to so many things, like prophecy, that she had always taken at face value without ever questioning. It also made her feel a little resentful for being duped her whole life by all the various established authorities who claimed absolute certainty on such subjects. Richard's discoveries were like finding the key to so much that had been proclaimed to be unknowable and beyond the scope of knowledge of mere mortals. It was a new world she would have to get used to with new rules and new challenges. But at least she felt as if the knowledge had given them the tools with which to fight to set things right. Now they knew what was really wrong, and that would better help Richard to do what he needed to do. End prophecy. The irony of the prophecy that he was the one to end prophecy wasn't lost on her. In a way, it was poetic justice. In a very fundamental way, what Richard had learned had already begun to cause prophecy to unravel. Nikki, as much as she understood the truth contained within the scrolls, had been somewhat shaken by what they had revealed. The sorceress had been a sister of the light, and had lived most of her life at the Palace of the Prophets, a place devoted to prophecy and teaching the gifted how to use it. But everything Nikki had learned there, and thought she knew, was built on misunderstanding and deception. When he had been taken there, Richard had peeled back the first layer, shedding new light on prophecy. Now he had discovered that the entire structure of prophecy had no foundation in reality. The scrolls weren't myth. It was prophecy itself that was really founded in myth. Of course, Nikki never held any favor with prophecy in the first place, so Colin supposed the woman wasn't as disturbed by what they had learned as she might otherwise have been. Nikki had always told them that she had viewed the study of prophecy as an onerous duty, and she had never taken delight in it the way many of the other sisters had. There were sisters there who had spent hundreds of years down in the vaults at the Palace of the Prophets, devoted to studying prophecy, delighting in what they believed they were learning, thinking they understood it. Colin wondered what Sister Verna would think of what the scrolls had revealed, if they ever had the chance to see the woman again. There were a number of sisters besides Verna now living at the Wizard's Keep in Idendril. While Colin had been somewhat disoriented and confused by learning that many of the things she thought she knew were wrong, she had a suspicion that many of those sisters would be bewildered and horrified that their whole world, everything they had believed and worked for, was not at all what they had thought. Not even close. As with all truth, there would be those who refused to believe it and would not even look at the proof. As they turned down the main street through the city, people in Savedra stared openly at the dozen big soldiers of the first file, riding tall in their saddles along with the three moored Sith in red leather, all escorting the Mother Confessor and the Lord Rawl. Colin wondered if most of these people even knew who the Lord Rawl was. After all, the only ruler they had known for most of their lives had been Hannes Ark. The Lord Rawl had always been a distant leader in a far-off land. 
As they rode through the city, the sound of the horses' hooves on the wet cobblestones echoed back from the warren of narrow streets and tightly packed buildings. Most of those buildings were low and drab, with only the ones on the main street having a second story. The wooden walls Colin could see had faded paint, if they had paint, and almost all of the wood was stained with dark, blotchy mold from the constant dampness. The shops in the lower floors sold basic goods and few luxuries that Colin could see. Life in the Darklands was about surviving, and few could afford the finer things in life. The entire city was hunched defensively inward, with its back turned to the surrounding dark lands and the things living in it. In side streets, vendors with small carts of bread or meats or general merchandise all watched with somber expressions as the column of horses trotted past. None rushed out to try to hawk their goods to the strangers riding past. The overcast sky was as dark and threatening as it always seemed to be in the dark lands. Colin couldn't remember the last time she had seen the sun. The constant gloom was depressing. The accumulating mist soaked the reins and the exposed leather of the saddle. She shook the hood of her cloak to shed some of the gathered water. At least it was only misting lightly and not raining. As the rapid clatter of all the hooves echoed through the canyons of tightly packed buildings, Colin patted the muscular neck of her bay mare, giving it a bit of reassurance that she would treat it well. Old scars on the horse's rump told Colin that previous riders had not been so kind or treated the horse well. They had obviously favored using a whip to make the animal do their bidding. The horse whinnied and tossed its head a little to let her know it had felt the gentle touch. Richard rode a big black gelding that carried his weight easily. By the way, it danced sideways at times when they stopped, told her that the horse had some spirit. Richard looked magnificent on the horse. It was good to see him on one again. In the dull light, his sword gleamed against his dark outfit. It was good to see him, too, with that glint of purpose in his eyes, even if those gray eyes also carried the shadow of poison. As they left the city behind, and as happy as she was to be out of the citadel, she was happier still to be out of the depressing city of Saavedra. It felt good to be away from all the eyes on her. She had no way of knowing if any of those people watching would have been loyal to Hannes Ark, or for that matter, to Emperor Sulachan. For all she knew, he could have minions anywhere. As they left the shelter of the city, though, there were other concerns. There was no telling who might be watching from the leafy shadows of the vast forests carpeting the wilderness. Commander Fister had been more than concerned that they were taking so few men. He wanted more than a dozen total in case they were set upon by half-people. Richard told him that their safety depended on speed and escape, not on standing and fighting a battle. To that end, they'd brought a string of extra mounts so they could trade off and give the animals a break. Cassia had reassured the commander that with three moored Sith along, they didn't need more men. His face screwed up with a sour expression, but he didn't say anything. Men of the first file had traditionally been the first line of defense for the Lord Rawl, but then so had the moored Sith. To Colin's knowledge, it had never formally been settled among them who took precedence. Mord Sith didn't think there was any need for formality. They believed that they took precedence and were never shy about making that point. Richard, along with the commander and other officers of the first file, never contradicted that assertion. Richard didn't see the need. There were always plenty of enemy to go around. Once they were clear of the city, Richard took the lead and set a pace that would make it difficult for anyone to stop them. The sight of the men with Richard at the lead reminded her of cavalry on the move. Any half-people on foot would be at a distinct disadvantage. Still, they had numbers that might even be able to overwhelm a column of horses moving at speed. If any appeared, though, they would move into a gallop. Stepping out in front of a pack of horses in a thundering gallop would be the last mistake they ever made. Richard pulled his horse to a halt as they reached a place where the road divided. Two of the men who had grown up in the dark lands drew their horses alongside him. Which way, Richard asked, left or right? The right is the shortest route, one of the men said. The left may be a little longer, but it's easier traveling, the other man said. Richard turned in his saddle to look back at Niki. Do you sense anything ahead on either road? Niki rested her wrists atop one another on the horn of her saddle as she looked off into the distance down each road. No, she finally said, I don't sense anyone. But that doesn't mean anything, really, with them able to mask their presence with occult powers. If they did that, I wouldn't be able to sense them. Richard tapped the side of his thumb on the horn of his saddle as he gazed down both roads, considering. Colin knew that he was worried about something other than half-people. 
He was concerned about Samantha trying to catch them out in the open with few men to protect them. Of course, soldiers would not really be much of an obstacle to the young sorceress. Colin suspected that the Mord Sith would not have any better of a chance to stop her. Mord Sith had the ability to capture a person's magic if it was used against them, but exactly what abilities Samantha had, they didn't know for sure, so it was hard to tell if a Mord Sith's abilities would work the same with Samantha. About the only thing they did know was that she was profoundly gifted and inventive in using that gift. The worst problem for the three Mord Sith, though, was that their Ajil didn't work. The Ajil depended on the bond to the Lord Rawl, so as long as Richard had that poison in him, the Mord Sith were at a disadvantage. What other limitations that imposed on their ability to function, Colin didn't know. They were all rightfully concerned about traveling through dense woodlands, knowing what Samantha was capable of. Colin was glad that the way they were going, so far at least, was not taking them through any gorges or along the bases of any cliffs. Samantha had proven that she could bring a mountain down on their heads if she wanted to. Then I'd rather the shortest distance, Richard finally said, as he urged his horse onto the road to the right. We need to make the best time we can. By the pace Richard was setting, it was clear that they would not have been able to make better time taking the better but longer road. She knew that Richard would make good time no matter how difficult the route. They'd brought relief mounts so they could change horses in order to maintain a quick pace. As the day wore on, the road began climbing in a series of switchbacks along the gentle rise of ever higher slopes. The road was too narrow and rocky to have accommodated a cart, much less wagons. Anyone using the route would have had to use horses or pack mules. The forest of shimmering leaves smelled of rot. Several times they had to stop so the men could push deadfalls off to the side of the road. The woodland silence was broken each time by the sound of the heavy, wet, rotted trees crashing down the side of the steep bank. Near dark they reached a turn in the road that went around a point of the mountain's edge. It afforded them a view off into the distance, in nearly every direction except behind. The terrain over their heads was too steep for any attack from above. Anyone who tried to come at them from over the mountain above them would surely fall and plummet to their death. No one could climb up from below, at least not in numbers and not at all quickly enough. This gives us a good place we can watch from, Richard said as he stood in his saddle, checking in every direction, gazing down on the expanse of forest spreading out below. It's getting dark fast. Let's stop here on the road and set up camp for the night. He pointed behind. There was a lot of grass for the horses growing to the sides, right there. You think it best to stop out in the open where half people could spot us? Cassia asked. I'd rather be in a place where we can see them coming from a long way off. They can't get to us going cross-country through the woods, and if they use the road, they can only come from ahead or behind. There is no other way to get to us here. That makes this spot, which might seem like it's out in the open, actually much easier for us to defend. He gestured to the rock wall at the apex of the curve around the prominence in the side of the mountain. We can put some tarps there and be protected against the weather if it starts to rain. It looks like it will be a damp and miserable night, Commander Fister said. What about fires to keep warm? Richard's mouth twisted. I'm not liking the idea of starting fires that could be seen or smelled for miles. It wouldn't attract anything good and might tip off anyone searching for us. I can use my gift to heat rocks, Nikki offered. At least they will keep us all warm. Richard nodded as he swung down out of his saddle. Post watches in both directions. He held the reins up close to the bit. No man stands watch alone. Double the men and keep watches short. We have enough men for us all to get some sleep. You heard the man, Commander Fister said as he swung down out of his saddle. Everyone else dismounted and set about the task of stringing up some small tarps to shelter them from the rain and gathering material to keep them up off the wet ground as they slept. Colin smiled to herself. She was finally going to get to cuddle up to Richard for at least a few hours' rest. As good a rest as she could expect anyway, with the twilight count marking the time until the end of the world while the half-people hunted for souls. Richard circled his big arm around her waist and smiled at her. What do you say we get something to eat? Chapter 34 Richard gently drew back on the reins, slowing his horse to a stop. It was an unexpectedly compliant animal that wanted to please and had willingly taken to his directions, but now its nostrils flared as it tossed its head, snorted and stepped about nervously. The other horses were just as unsettled. Richard patted the animal's shoulder. 
I smell it too, he murmured in a comforting voice. I don't like it any better than you. Everyone had come to a halt all around him. The three Mord Sith had closed in to get as close to him and Colin as they could. Mord Sith always wanted to be the closest layer of protection. Richard had long ago learned not only that they were capable and worthy of being in such a position, but it was a lot less trouble if he let them protect him in the way they thought best. The soldiers formed an outer ring surrounding the three women in red leather. They wanted to be the first to encounter any attacking enemy and stop them. So the Mord Sith and the soldiers of the first file were both content that they had their way. Before one of the horses could panic and bolt or throw their riders, Richard signaled everyone to dismount. What do you think? Nikki asked as she leaned closer to him after she was down on the ground. Richard's gaze moved across the shadows back in the woods, among the trees and rock outcroppings, checking for any sign of threat. Well, there is no mistaking that something is dead up ahead, he finally told her. The only question is what or who. And who did the killing, the sorceress added. Richard glanced over at her. There is that. Even at the distance they were from whatever it was that was dead, the smell was repulsive. He supposed it could be dead animals, but the hair standing on end at the back of his neck told him otherwise. Commander Fister held on to the reins to his horse as he stepped closer so he could whisper, Are we close to the village? Richard nodded. He was on familiar ground now. From the protection of the forested foothills, they all gazed across the open fields toward the cliff face in the distance. The mountain, thick with clinging vegetation, towered over the rough, raw rock face of the cliff. I don't hear anything, Richard said in an equally quiet voice as he leaned toward Niki. Can you sense anything? You should be able to sense all the people from here, shouldn't you? You should at least be able to sense the livestock, right? Niki's blue eyes turned from staring into the distance to look up at him. If there were any people or animals still alive, I would be able to sense it. She gestured to the thick trees towering over them to each side. I can sense small animals here. Some birds, a squirrel just out of sight over there, things like that. There are mice hiding down in holes under the leaf litter where we can't see them. She flicked a finger, gesturing out toward the fields. There are small living things like that in the fields, but on the other side toward the village. I don't sense anything. Richard wasn't at all surprised. That was what his intuition was telling him. Niki's words were all the confirmation he needed. He drew his sword. In the dead silence, the ring of steel echoed out across the fields, announcing the arrival of the Sword of Truth in the damp late-day air. All right, we're going to have to go have a look. Horses don't like the smell of death. If we take them any closer, they may panic and bolt. He gestured with his sword. Let's picket them back here. Tie the leads so they can get away if they have to. One of the men stepped in and took the reins from Richard as he peered out across the field, scanning for any movement, any sign of life. One of the other men took Colin's horse. Nikki and the three moored Sith handed over the reins to their horses when another man came to get them. The rest of the men drew their weapons. Colin stroked the neck of her bay mare. Take good care of her, she said with a smile to the soldier. She has given me an easy ride. He smiled back with a nod before leading the horse back to a small open area in the woods. Richard was already in the grip of the anger from the sword. The smell of death only served to make that rage flooding into him from the sword more urgent, joining with his own anger. Together those twin storms of rage spiraled through him, filling him with fury to prepare him for the fight. With the power of the sword in his hand, there was no mistaking the threat that hung in the air along with the stench of death. The magic of the sword wanted to meet that threat. Even though he didn't really know how to command his gift, it was always there, and it always responded to his rage. He was left with a strange emptiness when his gift was out of reach. The sword served to fill that void and more. With the sword and its power flooding through him, he felt alive with purpose. He shared a meaningful look with Colin, a look they had shared before when facing unknown dangers. He wanted to see her beautiful green eyes one last time before he began the dance with death. She touched his arm in silent answer. If you sense anything I need to know about, speak up, he said in a low voice as he leaned toward Niki before starting down the path between the green fields. She hurried to step in behind him. Colin took up a position beside her, both knowing enough to stay out of the way of his sword. Cassia and the other two moored Sith followed them. The soldiers guarded the rear, protecting them from anything that might swoop out of the woods. Richard wasn't sure exactly what Niki was able to sense with her gift, but he was sure that had his own gift been working, he would have been able to see the aura of power crackling around her. 
Even without being able to see it, it was not at all difficult for him to tell that she was on alert and would respond in a blink with withering force if need be. Colin was no less ready for trouble. The three moored Sith always expected trouble and were only surprised when there wasn't any. So far, though, nothing was emerging out beyond the fields. No people, no animals, and no threat. In the distance, across the slightly rolling ground spread out before them, in the face of the rock wall rising up from the far side of the fields, Richard could make out the dark opening into the cave village of Stroiza. He didn't see anyone standing in that opening. When he'd left Stroiza the last time, he had told the men to post a watch at all times, so that no half-people or walking dead could sneak up on them again. The people of the village were humble farmers who raised some livestock. They were not warriors. Even so, from up on the face of that sheer cliff, it would have been easy to repel any attackers climbing up the treacherous trail. All it would take was throwing some rocks down at any threat trying to come up to attack the village. He should have been able to see those lookouts standing watch and also looking out for their livestock below, but he saw no one up in the cavern opening. On the way toward the cliff, the foot trail passed between large fields, some planted with grain, some with hay, and others with vegetables and fruit trees. Some of those vegetables were mature and ready but remained unpicked. Some were past ripe. Apples, pears, and plums were turning dark as they were past their prime. More lay rotting on the ground. Now that they had left the protection of the forest and were out in the open among the fields, Richard felt exposed and vulnerable. The reality was that they would have been nearly as vulnerable back in the woods, but he always felt better when he was in the forests. Even though these woods were different from his heartland woods, they were still comfortingly familiar. He knew how to live in woods, how to fight among the trees, and how to evade an enemy there. Bugs flitted and buzzed above the grass, with orange butterflies feeding on small blue wildflowers growing among the grapevines. Swarms of bees fed on both the ripe fruit still on the trees and the rotting fruit on the ground. Other than those bugs, he saw nothing alive and no movement. In the dead still air, thick with the stench of death, not a leaf, not a branch, not a blade of grass moved. He did hear a low hum, though. He couldn't quite place the vaguely familiar sound. The last time he had been in Stroiza, there had been animals in the buildings and pens at the foot of the cliff. If they were still there, he didn't hear them. As they made their way past the fields to the split rail fences, he found out why. Hogs lay dead in their pens. Two milk cows, their legs sticking stiffly out from their bloated bodies, lay in dirty runnels of muddy water. Blood-stained sheep were piled in a tight cluster in the corner of where a fence met a building. Dead chickens lay scattered here and there around the yards. The feathers settled everywhere atop the mud and manure reminded him a little of snow. What could have done this? Colin whispered on their way past the dead hogs. She put her hand back over her nose. All the rest of them held up a hand or an arm, trying to block the putrid stench. The small group made their way through a sprawling boulder field of broken rock that had built up over time as the weather had cleaved rock from the cliff face to accumulate below. In some places they had to walk single file among the boulders, and in a few spots had to duck in turn under massive slabs of stone that over the millennia had fallen from the face of the mountain to now rest atop the jumble of boulders. As they came around and through the clutter of boulders, Richard stopped in his tracks when he at last spotted the people of Stroiza. The buzzing noise he had heard had been clouds of flies. The corpses lay piled in massive heaps atop one another, on top of and down between the rocks at the bottom of the cliff. They all rested wherever they had landed. Arms and legs sprawled at crazy angles. Maggots wriggled in places where flesh had split open. They all held their noses, wincing, gagging on the putrefying stench. The air was so thick with the powerful smell he could taste it. As he got closer, holding the crook of his arm over his nose and mouth to try to at least partially block the smell, he recognized some of the individuals. He peered out from just over his arm. These were the people who had rescued him and Colin. Many of them had protected and helped them. He had fought with these men to stop the animated dead that invaded their cave village. He saw Esther, the woman who had helped him and Colin when they had first been brought to the village. Now, flies walked across her dead eyes, staring up at the sky. Richard waved his sword over her body, chasing the flies away. Dear spirits, please protect these dear souls, Colin whispered from right beside him. She put her hand back, pinching her nose and covering her mouth. Richard signaled with his sword for the men to check around the piles of bodies for any who might be alive. He knew there couldn't be anyone alive, but he had to check. 
From the way they were piled together and the broken bones stuck out through clothes, it looked to him that these people had all fallen from the cave opening high up on the cliff. Commander Fister shook his head from the far side of the corpses. Poor souls, all dead. Terrible way to die. There are much worse ways, Cassius said. At least it looks to have been quick for these people. They didn't suffer. Richard knew she was right, but that didn't make it any easier to see all of these dead people, the entire village, all lying tangled in death below their village. He had seen a lot of death, but this was making him feel sick. Do you see any wounds from a fight? Richard asked the commander as the man made his way back around, stepping over the odd legs or arms sticking out from the bottom of the piles. Commander Fister, looking all business now, shook his head. It doesn't appear to have been any kind of fight, but it's a little hard to say for sure. If I had to hazard a guess, I'd say they all fell to their death. He scratched the side of his neck. Strange, though. What's strange? Richard asked. The commander cocked his head as he looked in at the tangled mass of corpses. There are some dead cats in among the people. Cats? Niki asked with a frown. The commander nodded. I can see eight or ten at least. There were a lot of cats living up there in the village, Colin said. They must have fallen or jumped along with the people. Commander Fister was frowning at the dead. Some of the cats look like their fur has been singed off. Probably decomposition, Cassia said. They've all been here for a while since they all fell from up there. Niki looked up at the cave opening high above. What I would like to know is what would make all these people jump from up there? Good question, Richard said. Let's go have a look. Chapter 35 Richard led the five women and twelve men to the point where the narrow path started up along the face of the rock wall. Set back behind a tangle of scrubs and small scraggly maple trees behind the boulders, it would have been easy to miss had he not known where it was. He looked back, taking account to make sure everyone was with him. Lord Raw, the commander said in a quiet voice, we don't know what sort of trouble might be up top. Why don't you let me take the men and go up first, ahead of you? Richard lifted his sword along with an eyebrow to make his point that there was more safety behind the sword he carried than the soldiers. Knowing that arguing would be useless and realizing that Richard was probably right, the commander only sighed. Would you like me to post any men down here to make sure no one sneaks up behind us? No, I want us all to stay together. Richard gestured up the cliff with his sword. I've used the trail before. It would be safer if I go first, then it will be easier for you to follow after seeing the best place to step. If anyone slips and falls, it could take the rest down. So watch where I put my feet and where I use handholds. It's really not a terribly difficult trail as long as you're careful. After Commander Fister nodded, Richard began the climb upward. Colin followed close behind him, then the three moored Sith, then Niki, then the soldiers. There was no back door, no secondary entrance, no other way up to the cliff village of Stroiza except the path that followed along natural crags and ledges of the rock face. Where there were no natural footholds, the rock had been laboriously chipped away to create them. In places, softer rock underfoot had been smoothed by the feet of people who, for thousands of years, climbed and descended the cliff wall on a daily basis. Be careful, Richard called back over his shoulder to those following behind. The rock in this section is smooth, and the drizzle makes it slippery along here. The people who lived here were familiar with the trail, but we aren't. Pay attention to where you step, and use these natural handholds along here like I'm doing. In some places where there were natural lifts of ledge, the path was wide enough to walk comfortably along. Even so, the path was still only wide enough for them to climb in single file. Some places were dangerously narrow and, even without the drizzle, quite treacherous. Fortunately, in those places, there were iron bars pinned into the face of the rock, so that particularly narrow spots didn't feel so dangerous. It might have been easier for Richard to climb the trail without having to hold his sword, but he didn't want to put it away. Besides, he felt that he knew the trail well enough by now to manage with his sword out. Most of the men kept their swords out as well, so he kept an eye on them to make sure they were being careful. Some of them were as agile as mountain goats and had no difficulty. The people of Stroiza, using the trail all their lives, had been familiar enough with it to carry supplies up and down without much of a problem. But the bodies at the bottom only served to bring into stark relief the dangers of the height. Richard looked down the face of the cliff from time to time to check on Colin and the rest of them. Each time he looked down, he couldn't help noticing the sprawled, tangled remains of the people of Stroiza. 
He felt profoundly sorry for these simple people living out in the middle of the Dark Lands. They had lived successfully in a dangerous land for generation after generation. He wished he knew who had thrown them off the cliff, or made them jump. These were the people who were the sentries, meant to be the ones to alert everyone else of the threat from the Third Kingdom once the barrier was breached. They had never been able to send out that alert. As a result, they had somehow fallen victim to that threat, escaping from the north. He remembered the walking corpses that had attacked not long after Colin had been rescued and first taken to Stroiza by the villagers. Had he not been there with his sword, these people might very well have all died at that time. He wondered if more of those walking dead had returned to finish what they had not been able to accomplish the first time. Even if that had been the case, lookouts perched high above should have been able to simply knock any attackers off the wall. It was possible, he supposed, that anything the villagers could have thrown at such beings, powered by occult magic, might not have been enough. Other than that possibility, what had happened didn't make sense to him. When Richard finally made it up to the top and stepped into the naturally formed broad cavity, he could see that it was dark down all of the cave-like passages and tunnels going deeper back into the mountains. Within short order, everyone behind him made it onto the safe ground of the cavern floor. In the natural light coming in through the broad cliff opening, the men rushed to collect torches standing in baskets to the sides so that they could light their way for a search deeper into the caves. After Niki used her gift to light them, the men held up the torches, allowing them to peer into dark passageways. Richard led them all a short distance into one of the broader passageways. There were a number of rooms built into natural clefts and crags along the way back into the cavern. Many more of the rooms in the network of tunnels had been excavated from the semi-soft rock. Lumps of granite, anywhere from fist-sized to pieces so enormous that there was no telling how big they might be, were embedded in the softer rock. Much of the ceiling was composed of the massive slabs of granite. Those ledges helped form a strong and stable ceiling. The caves were excavated from the amalgam of different rock under that harder stone. When the cave village had been hollowed out from the mountain, the tunnels and passageways had to be dug mostly through the natural veins of softer rock. Richard remembered how that left a tangled network of passageways. It was easy to get lost back in those caverns. The fronts of some of the hollowed-out rooms had mortared stone walls filling in the gaps. Some openings had simple wooden doors, while others were covered with animal skins. The rooms created a community of small homes. Richard cupped a hand to the side of his mouth and yelled into the darkness, Is anyone here? It's Richard. I've come back. His voice echoed back from the darkness, and when that echo died out, the caves were dead silent. He couldn't say that he was surprised. He thought by the number of bodies at the bottom that it looked like all the people of Stroiza were dead. Richard turned back to the men and pointed in several places with his sword at the dwellings honeycombed throughout the warren of passages. Check in all the rooms. See if anyone is still alive. Richard suspected, because of the degree of decomposition of the bodies, that whatever or whoever had killed the people of Stroiza, the threat was probably long gone. But he kept his sword out anyway. Do you sense anything alive back there? Richard quietly asked Niki as she came up beside him. She gazed silently down the passageways for a moment. It's hard to tell. The network of caverns causes reflections that make it difficult to say for sure, but I don't think there is anything down there for me to sense. Richard took a torch from one of the men, motioning for him to go retrieve another. Maybe if we go farther in, he told Niki, you will be able to tell better. Niki went with him to one side, Colin staying close on the other side. The three moored Sith, each with a torch, stepped out in front to light the way and check for threat. They left the men behind, checking rooms, as Richard and the women moved deeper into the broad cavern. He could see that it would funnel them into a smaller passageway. Intersections branched off to the sides as they cautiously went deeper. The three moored Sith momentarily held their torches out toward the branching passageways, checking, but they saw no one. The soldiers were conducting a more thorough search taking the time to do a thorough check of each room. The Mord Sith threw back the hanging over a doorway to their left to take a quick look inside, making sure everything was clear and that there was no threat. Richard saw pillows used as seating in the rooms, but he saw no people. Behind them, a thunderous roar suddenly shook the ground, nearly knocking them from their feet. A blinding flash of light lit the walls all around. Chapter 36 
Richard and the five women with him spun just in time to see the intense flash send an expanding wall of dust and dirt blasting through the cave. The bodies of all the soldiers came apart in midair among the ignition of light before the remains were blown out the cave opening along with bits of rock and rolling dust. Richard spread his arms as he scooped up the others and slammed them back against the wall out of the way of the blast. Dust and debris thundered past them on its way back into the caves. None of the men had cried out. They were all dead before they knew what had hit them. What was left of them fell through space to the rocks below to join the rest of the human remains rotting out in the rain. Richard took quick appraisal of the women with him. They were all panting and wide-eyed from the force of the unexpected explosion, but otherwise looked unharmed. With his finger and thumb, he pulled what looked like a long, bloody splinter of bone from Colin's hair and tossed it aside. Seeing that they were all right, he turned, sword in hand, rage thundering through him, and snatched a quick look back around the curve in the tunnel, back toward the cave entrance. He blinked and stuck his head back out for a longer look at what he had seen, and knew then that he had been right the first time. Someone small was standing silhouetted against the light coming in the cavern opening, Richard knew instantly who it was. Samantha, wearing a dark cloak with the hood containing her mass of dark hair, stepped farther out of an intersection to the side between Richard and where the men of the first file had been. Now, those men were all dead. It had happened in a blink. The shape of the cavern had directed most of the force of the blast out the large opening and had taken the men with it. That had lessened the force of the blast back in the smaller passageways where Richard and the others were. As soon as he spotted Samantha, Richard hooked an arm around Colin's middle and pulled her farther back in a passageway to the side. At the same time, he used his sword arm to shove back the three moored Sith. Niki dove in after them just in time as a crackling bolt of lightning shot past to shatter rock off the wall farther down the tunnel. Pieces of rock and rubble tumbled and bounced down the passageway. The floor everywhere was now littered with debris, some of it bloody. Without pause, Nikki immediately returned to the attack. A deafening, twisting ignition of both additive and subtractive magic exploded into being at the ends of her outstretched hands, arcing its way across the cave toward Samantha. Richard had seen that kind of fused power cut through steel. Rock ripped off the walls where the blinding bolt of power hit, but to Richard's surprise and Nikki's, Samantha merely lifted an arm, casually brushing aside the deadly lightning as if it were a petty nuisance. Samantha, Richard screamed, what are you doing? What needs to be done, she said in a strangely calm voice. You said you hate me, but you are killing innocent people. You've killed the people you grew up with. You killed the people of your own village. Nikki turned and rammed her fist into Richard's chest, driving him back around a curve in a side tunnel, just in time as a bolt of crackling lightning from Samantha thundered through the cave, shattering rock and filling the cave with billowing clouds of dust. The intensity of the light was blinding and left an afterglow in his vision that made it hard to see. Some of the others coughed and choked on the dust. As destructive as it was, he knew she was only toying with him. She wouldn't want him to die that quickly or that easily. Richard looked back around the corner and saw Samantha walking purposefully toward them. He saw serious scratches on her skinny arms. The scratches looked like they were from cat claws. It was then, as the light and shadow changed in the way it played across her, that Richard again saw the same faint shape of something in her face that he had seen before when she had attacked him in the field outside the citadel. As she stepped out of the light and into a deep shadow, even though she was in partial darkness, he saw it more clearly. It was darker than the shadow, darker than black, darker than the blackest night. Staring in astonishment as she backed through the cave along with the rest of them, Colin apparently saw it too. What is that? It looks familiar. When he saw the shape twist and tighten as if an extension of Samantha's dark mood, Richard recognized it then. That same dark shape had once enveloped him, tightened around him. But this time, it had been accepted willingly. Now he understood the burned cats and the scratches on Samantha's arms. Cats were creatures that could sometimes see spirits in this world. It's one of the dark ones, Richard said. The dark ones? Cassia asked, her voice filled with rage and urgency to eliminate the threat. What are you talking about? From the underworld, Nikki said as she stared at the otherworldly sight. I recognize it now, too. It's one of the demons that had Richard in the underworld, one of Sulachan's dark ones taking him down into oblivion. 
Then what's it doing here in this world? Lauren asked in an equally heated voice. The veil is failing, Richard said as he used his free arm to push them back farther while keeping his sword out and an eye toward Samantha. She kept coming, matching their pace, shadowing them. Sulachan is tearing the veil more all the time. He apparently was able to bring some of his minions through. Give yourself over to us, Samantha called out to him, and we will let the others go. None of them believed a word of it. Sulachan and the Dark Ones from the Underworld wanted to eliminate Richard because he was the only possible threat to them. You give up and give yourself over to us, Richard said. Samantha answered by abruptly throwing another bolt of otherworldly power, sending it flying back through the cave. It hit the walls, skipping off one side and then the other, sending showers of rock flying as it raced back toward Richard and the others. This time there was no cover close enough. Knowing they wouldn't be able to evade it, Richard made a split-second decision and stepped out, holding the sword by the hilt in one hand and the point in the other as a shield. The tumbling fireball split when it hit the sword, sending streamers of lightning and fire crashing into the walls at each side. Richard's fears were confirmed when he saw that there was not even one soldier behind Samantha. She had killed Commander Fister and the entire detachment of men with them. Richard, Colin, Niki, and the three moored Sith were the only ones left. They had no choice but to withdraw deeper into the caves to try to stay away from the young sorceress. Samantha, Richard yelled out as he backed deeper into the caverns. You have to stop. Your hatred of me is inviting evil into yourself. Stop. Think about what you're doing. Her hands fisted at her sides. I know exactly what I'm doing, she screamed. I'm killing the murderer of my mother. You have to listen to me, Richard called out to her as he took several steps back. I tried to explain it to you before. You need to stop and talk to me about it. You need to let me tell you what was happening with your mother. Let me help you to reason it out so you can see the truth for yourself. You have to listen to the truth. She lowered her head, arms stiff at her sides. Colin grabbed a fistful of Richard's sleeve. We're in trouble. That's what she did when she blew apart the rock cliffs in a gorge. Colin's right, Niki said. Samantha buried an entire army of the half-people when she did that. That's why I said we are in trouble, Colin said. Cassia started for the young sorceress, but Richard snatched her arm just in time to yank her back, nearly pulling her off her feet in the process. No, you don't, he told her in a heated voice. She will kill you in a heartbeat. I can stop her, Lord Roll. That's what Mord Sith do. We absorb the magic of anyone who tries to use it against us. We can capture their magic. Let me... No, he said as he moved with them back toward a corner. My gift doesn't work, so the bond doesn't work. So your agile doesn't work, and that means your ability to absorb magic won't work either. As he looked over his shoulder to make sure they were all moving behind cover, holding a tight grip on the leather at Cassia's shoulder, pulling her with him, Lauren ducked around the other side of him. She darted away before Richard was able to grab her. The blonde moored Sith, a geel in her fist, charged right for Samantha, daring her to try to use magic against her. Richard was able to catch Vale and prevent her from joining Lauren. Samantha never moved. Her head was bowed, her eyes closed. The shadowy spirit of the demon seemed to writhe with gleeful menace. Before Richard could do anything to go after Lauren, the air of the cave jolted with a hard impact, as if the entire mountain had been struck with a giant hammer. At the same time, Lauren's form exploded in a shower of black bits, like crystals of a night stone. Her red leather collapsed to the floor, the black crystals that had been Lauren spilling out of the openings at the wrists and ankles. There was nothing left of the moored Sith but charred black bits scattered across the floor. Cassia and Vale both screamed in rage as they charged for Samantha. Richard snatched each one in an arm just in time and yanked them back behind the corner of the intersection. As he tumbled back with the two moored Sith, falling at Niki and Colin's feet, the walls began to shudder as if in a violent earthquake. Thunderous explosions hammered through the cavern, ringing in his ears. She's doing it, Niki said through gritted teeth. She's bringing the rock down on us. We need to get out of here, Colin said. But there really wasn't anywhere to run. All they could do was try to stay out of Samantha's direct line of fire. To the left, a slab of rock exploded, sending fragments ricocheting and bouncing up and down the passageway as the main section dropped heavily to the floor. One side of another small slab of the granite ceiling let go and fell, coming to rest on the floor, while the other half remained lodged up in the softer rock of the ceiling. 
Richard pushed the two moored Sith back, giving them an unmistakable warning look. Colin and Nikki grabbed them and held them back so he could take a quick look around the corner. When the explosion paused briefly, he was able to peek around the corner to get a good look. He saw Samantha, with that grim black shadow of the demon twisting with rage in the same place as the girl as she marched toward them. Her arms were still stiff, her hands in fists, her head lowered. When she spotted him, she glared with unrestrained rage and hate and kept coming. She was coming for him. Chapter 37 Richard wondered if he could get close enough to her to use the sword. That ruled out using the sword as a shield first, because it gave her too much time with him in the open. In his mind, he planned what he would need to do. He decided that he would race out from cover to draw her attention. She would change the focus of an attack toward him. That shift of her attention would take a fraction of a second, making her redirected attack less accurate. As she rushed to cast out another lightning bolt of power, he could throw himself to the ground, roll under it, and then spring up in front of her. If he could get in that close, he was pretty sure he would be able to take her down with the sword before she could react. If she didn't miss, though, it would all be over. He would be dead. Sulachan and Hannah's Ark would win. Prophecy would live, at least until the world of life died out. He gripped the sword tighter in both hands and gritted his teeth, readying himself to charge at the young sorceress. Samantha stopped. She growled in rage, her whole body trembling with fury. When he snuck a quick glance, Richard could see the shape of the demon in the same place as her, in much the same way that Sulichan's spirit occupied his desiccated corpse in the same place at the same time. But Samantha was not an innocent victim who was possessed by an evil spirit. She had invited that hateful spirit into her with her irrational, out-of-control anger and hate. Now they were one in purpose. Now they both were determined to kill. The Dark One was using her, encouraging her, and Samantha was willingly summoning the full power of her unbridled wrath. As she shook with anger, the rock of the cave trembled in response. He knew what she was doing. He had, after all, taught her to do it. Richard knew that he had no time to lose. If he was going to stop her, it had to be now, before she brought the rock down on them. He had no hesitation about the need to kill her. If that dance with death had taught him anything, it was that his life and the lives of innocent people couldn't be forfeited for sentiment. A lethal threat had to be recognized for the reality of what it was. Such threats had to be stopped. Before he could charge out, Richard had to duck when a slab of thicker stone behind them blew apart. Jagged shards of rock whistled through the air, one going over the top of his bowed head, just missing him. Then another area out in front of him and down a side tunnel exploded apart. All up and down the passageways, rock began exploding in a ripping string of thunderous blasts. The cave trembled with the unfathomable force Samantha was focusing into the rock, blowing it apart. The echo of explosions rippled throughout the cave. Thunderous blasts rang out painfully in the confined space as the explosions of rock came almost one atop another. Richard was pelted with pieces of rock that sailed through the passageway and ricocheted off walls. The whole mountain shook. He had to close his eyes and turn his face away from debris clouds that blew past him. The sound of it was deafening. And then, out in front of him, where he was just about to charge out at Samantha and tumble under anything she could throw at him, the entire ceiling let out a reverberating, crackling boom as it was abruptly driven downward by a thunderous explosion. The massive section of the mountain above them had suddenly collapsed. The force of the entire ceiling giving way shook the mountain so violently that Richard, Colin, Niki, Cassia, and Vale were all knocked from their feet. Along with the moored Sith, Richard immediately rolled up onto a hand and a knee, with his other foot on the ground, ready to spring into the fight. Colin was on her hands and knees, looking dazed. They all turned their faces away from the blast of wind forced out from under the rock as it came crashing down. The blast of the shockwave caught Niki off balance and knocked her flat on her back. The two moored Sith were also sent tumbling back by the wall of air. Richard braced for the next blast, looking to the sides to try to find a place for them to run, a shelter where they could get away from the flying rock. But there was no other intersection. There was no immediate route for an escape. Cassia and Vale scrambled to their feet, picking up their torches off the ground as they did so. The torches hissed and sputtered, but other than that, the debris settled. Rocks rolled to a stop, and everything began to go quiet. The rumbling and shaking had stopped. The explosions had stopped. 
the echoes of it all gradually died out. Richard wondered what would be coming next, what power Samantha would unleash. He needed to stop her first. In the sudden silence, he finally peeked around the corner and saw something out ahead of them, beyond the nearly empty red leather moored Sith outfit. He took a torch from Vale and cautiously inched out from the protection of the jut of rock where he had been to see if it was what he thought it was. He stood to his full height when he saw that he had been right. It was Samantha's bloody arm sticking out from beneath a massive section of granite that had collapsed from overhead. It had crushed the young woman. Well, isn't that something? Cassius said as she stepped up beside Richard, holding her torch up with one hand as she brushed the dirt off herself with the other. The wavering light of their torches lit the bloody forearm and fist, the only thing they could see of Samantha. The rest of her was buried under countless tons of stone that had let go and come down atop her. She gets so angry, so focused, Collins said, that she forgets about her own safety. When we were in the gorge when the army of half-people were chasing us, she was bringing the mountain down atop them, and I had to snatch her up and carry her away or it would have come down on top of her just like this. Niki was nodding in agreement. I saw that immaturity in her. It frightened me from the first. Her ability exceeded her capacity to handle it. That bloody arm had a ghostly appearance to it, a dark shadow that moved as if it were alive, whereas the arm was dead still. As Richard watched, that shadow faded away into nothing. The demon that had been with her, helping her, had melted back beyond the veil. Without a worldly form to possess and hold it in the world of life, it could not keep the screen from pulling it back into the world of the dead. For now, some of those forces still held, at least to a certain extent. I can't believe she so willfully killed those men, Collins said. She knew them. She liked them. At least she did at one time. She had helped them. I can hardly believe she would so easily kill them. Richard felt a twinge of sadness for the girl whose ability made her so out of place and who had been trying so hard to become a woman. She'd had such potential. He guessed that the potential and talent did her no good in the end when she instead let herself be ruled by hate. In the end, hate destroyed her. She killed her entire village as well, Richard said. The people she had grown up with and had hoped to protect. Niki glared at the bloody, splintered arm. I told you she was dangerous, that her anger was dangerous. One of the wizard's rules I learned long ago, Richard said. Passion rules reason. I'm sorry that I didn't see the indications in her sooner. Had I paid more attention to the signs, I might have been able to help her to choose positive things rather than the dishonesty of hate. I guess I was blind to it, thinking she just needed to grow up a little. A lot, Niki grumbled. You couldn't have helped her, Richard. It was what was inside her. It was her inborn nature. None of us could have changed her. Richard squatted down and touched the red leather that had belonged to Lauren. She gave her life trying to protect you, Lord Rawl, Cassia said, in comfort. Any of us would have done the same. She died a noble death. As did all those men, he said. But they are all still dead. He picked the Aegeal out of the black crystallized pieces that were all that was left of Lauren. He stood and showed it to Vale. Now you must wear the Aegeal of a brave moored Sith, a sister of the Aegeal, as does Cassia, and gain strength from it. She bowed her head as he placed the chain around her neck. I'm sorry that those men and Lauren had to die this day. Those men of the first file and Lauren died to protect you, Lord Rawl, Cassia said. That was their chosen calling. They died doing what they wanted most to do. They were all honored by your trust in them. They died heroes in their mission to make sure you and the Mother Confessor were safe now. He smiled his thanks for her words. We're not exactly safe, though, Richard said as he looked up at the solid wall of rock. I'm afraid we're trapped in here. Chapter 38 What do you mean we're trapped in here? Niki asked with a mix of suspicion and concern. There were passageways everywhere. There have to be interconnecting tunnels running all through this place. There has to be a way to get around this collapsed section of ceiling. As his gaze swept over the wall of rock, Richard slowly shook his head. You're right that the tunnels interconnect. A little farther back, we could have gone down some of those side intersections, and they would take us a different way around to the opening at the top of the cliff. 
but not this far back in this particular corridor. We are now in a dedicated corridor that runs back deeper into the mountain. This passageway is unlike the rest. It has a primary purpose, so it doesn't have the typical intersecting routes that crisscross in and out of the general network of tunnels. The builders apparently intended to limit access to it. It does have side branches with a number of rooms, some of them places where people lived, but those side passageways are all part of this limited access area, so none of them lead back out. They all dead end. From back here, the only way back out, back into the general tunnel complex, is through this collapsed wall of rock. Maybe it's not as big a problem as it seems, Cassia said, trying to sound positive. Maybe the five of us can dig our way out. It probably wouldn't be as hard as it looks. Richard frowned over at her. Look at it. He gestured to the wall of rock. Cassia, it's solid granite. It's not a pile of rubble that maybe we could dig through. It's a single massive block of granite. Granite is often layered in thick lifts like this. Some of those slabs can be dozens of feet thick and they can run on horizontally for quite some distance. Weather will create and open up natural breaks but protected inside a mountain like this, these lifts are massive. It must have fractured along a natural horizontal split higher up in the rock and because of what Samantha was doing, the unsupported weight all dropped down into this void. Maybe it's not very wide though, Colin offered. People cut granite into blocks to use in buildings. Sure, Richard said, but that takes specialized chisels and wedges to split the rock. We don't have any of that. Colin turned hopefully to Niki. Maybe you can use your gift to open up a hole. Maybe crack the rock or something to get us through to the other side? Move some of it aside? Niki frowned her incredulity. There's no way. The entire face of the mountain was weakened by what Samantha was doing. Remember what she did in that mountain gorge? This here all dropped down into the void of the caverns like stepping on an anthill. The whole network of tunnels from this point back is crushed. It's solid rock from here to what used to be the mouth of the cavern. How far is that? Vale asked, hopefully. Richard made a bit of a face at her. How long were we running to get away from her? Vale looked sheepish. A pretty long way, I guess. You guess right. It's hundreds of feet. We might as well be inside the middle of the mountain. He pointed to the side. Look at the way the softer stone is pushed out into this void back here. That's a good indication of the massive size and weight of all the granite that came down from above. As extensive as the network of caves may be to the mountain, it's like the anthills Niki mentioned. From here to the outside, there are no longer any caves. They are all crushed. There is nothing to dig through or cut through. The original people who made these caves surely had hundreds of workers and the tools necessary for such an undertaking. We don't. Colin folded her arms. What are we doing here, Richard? Richard looked over at her. What do you mean? Richard, we're all afraid. We're going to die in here if there isn't another way out. You wanted to come here because you said it was too far to make it back to the People's Palace. There isn't a containment field here where Niki could extract that poison from you. So why are we here? What's really going on? Richard pressed his lips together a moment. Well, I figured you all would think I was crazy. So I wanted to find it first. Colin kept her admonishing gaze fixed on him. Find what? It was clear she expected the truth. It was also clear to him that she deserved it. So did the rest of them. A well for the sliff. The cavern rang with silence for a moment as everyone stared at him. Colin's expression shifted to a frown. The sliff? You think the sliff has a well here? Why would you think that? Richard let out a deep breath as he gestured to the southwest. Look how far it is back to the people's palace. It's even farther to the wizard's keep in Iden Drill. He turned back, sharing a look with both Colin and Niki. The sorceress in charge here at Stroiza was supposed to keep watch and then go to the keep to warn them that after thousands of years the barrier to the Third Kingdom had been breached and the greatest threat to mankind that has ever existed was now on the loose. That is Stroiza's purpose. That's why it was built here by the same people who built the barrier. And that's why a gifted person has always lived here. Puzzled, Colin shrugged. What of it? So... You think the builders of the barrier containing that great evil expected this one person to run all the way back to the keep and warn everyone that the barrier had been breached by that evil? 
They entrusted the fate of the new world, the fate of life itself, to this one sorceress, to run all the way back to the wizard's keep. The fate of the world depended on her evading half-people, staying out of the clutches of a spirit king risen from the dead, his reanimated dead, occult powers, and all the natural threats and difficulties making the journey all the way across the trackless forests of the Darklands entailed. She had to make it across wilderness, mountain ranges, and then across more mountains and Dahara to finally get to the wizard's keep to warn the wizards there? Really? You really believe that people gifted and intelligent enough to build a barrier that stood for 3,000 years, build the citadel, and build this place to watch over the barrier would do that? Put the fate of the world in the hands of a sorceress from this place, successfully making such a long and perilous journey? Niki folded her arms as she glanced over at Colin. I hate to say it, but when he puts it that way, it's hard to disagree. The threat was deadly serious and profoundly difficult to handle. If it could have been ended, they would have ended it back in the Great War rather than lock it away behind the barrier. Right, Richard said. So they wouldn't have depended on one person to travel all that way and put their faith in her making it there safely much less make it in time for them to do something about the expanding threat. She would have faced the same problem we have now. Time. She wouldn't be able to make it there in time, and worse, the half-people that had escaped would likely already be out ahead of her. So she would not only have to evade being caught and eaten, she would have to find a way to get past them. Colin stared off in thought for a moment before speaking. A well for the slith would have given the lookout here a swift and easy way to get back to the keep. It makes sense. It's the only thing that makes sense, Richard said. Colin folded her arms. So if there is a well here for the sliff, why didn't we see it when we were here before? Samantha showed you the shielded caves where Naja Moon wrote instructions and where they have the viewing port. So where is this well if there really is one here? I don't know exactly, Richard admitted. I never saw it when I was here before, but I saw the shielded areas, so I figured there must be a shielded room with a well for the sliff, like there is at the keep. All we have to do is find it. Nikki aimed a thumb back at the granite wall that used to be the ceiling. What if it's under there? Like I said, this is a dedicated corridor with no other way in. I think that was by design to keep it safe. I think we are in the right passageway. Colin was still staring off in thought. We could get back to the palace in short order. Niki could cure you then, and then you would be able to stop Sulachan and end prophecy. 